Gracias. I can always go live with these. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where everybody is. I'd like to welcome you all to the CUGC XL West. Wanted to thank you for all taking your time to join us today. We're so glad you're here. Make sure to say hello in the chat and let us know where everyone's coming from. Josh Bernstein and I will be your MCs for the event today. We're excited to be your, gu your guides for today. First off, we'd like to start with some thank yous. A big thank you to the CUGC team who has attended regular planning meetings and provide us input and ideas to make this a successful event. We'd like to thank our speakers today. We got an awesome speaker lineup starting off with our keynote, Michael Rogers, a technology expert and a practical futurist, followed by some of our favorite CTAs, CTPs, and Citrix speakers. Finally, we owe a big thank you to all of our event sponsors, because without their support, this event would, would not be possible. Today's sponsors are Liquidware, Nutanix, Automai, ControlUp, EG Innovations, Goliath, iGel, Stratadesk, Tenzig, and of course, Citrix. Make sure to check out their boots throughout the day. Check out all of their awesome resources. Ask them any questions you have. Answer the poll questions. And if you do hit all eight of the sponsor boots, you'll be answered to win uh, a great prize for today. After that, I'll hand it off to Josh. Yeah, we have a, a packed agenda today, a lot going on. First, an amazing keynote with Michael Rogers, followed up by a panel discussion with CTA's Ray Davis, Mike Streets, Casper Johansson, and moderated by Patrick Cobble. After that, Pat Patterson with Citrix will walk through micro apps and at Citrix Converge. Then we'll wrap up presentations with a deep dive on CVAD services on Azure by Scott Osborne, Shane Kleiner, and James Kinden. And that's all presented here on the main stage. After the um, after the presentations, you can move over to the sessions tab and join the roundtables hosted by each of the speakers. And this is just a continued conversation uh, around their topic. Bring your questions, join in or on camera, or just listen in. Of course, make sure you're following CUGC on Twitter. Make sure you live tweet throughout the event um, to uh, for a chance to win Apple AirPods. We actually have a lot of prizes to give away. Um, end users that are here today have already been entered to win a $500 Amazon gift card. Yes, $500. Um, we, uh, sorry, um, make sure you visit, oh, the slides are flipping around. Um, there we go. Uh, I think we jumped ahead, but um, wait for it to get back. I'll just go ahead. Um, but basically, um, make sure you visit every sponsor booth. Uh, this is in the Expo tab. And make sure you ask them questions and respond to their poll um, in the chat. And this is um, for a chance for um, one of eight people to win a $100 Amazon gift card but you have to visit the booths by 2.45 p.m. Pacific, and you must be an end user. Um, throughout the day, we are going to randomly select attendees who have been chatting, uh, asking questions, interacting, visiting sponsor booths, attending the roundtable sessions, and that will be to win an Apple AirTag. So make sure you're noticed by interacting. And um, here, uh, make sure you stay to the end because we have, again, a lot of prizes. Um, if you opted in at registration, uh, four winners will win um, an Apple AirPod, the Underbike 
under desk bike, which is pretty cool. I kind of want one of those now. Uh, Bose headphones and um, the uh, webcam with the ring light. Uh, last chance to get your 2021 CUGC t-shirt. The link will be given out uh, after the prizes session. And we have uh, regular webinar webinars all year long. You can find the list at mycugc.org. With that, local events are happening all the time, virtually or in person, depending on where you are. Uh, if you want to attend more events, you can check them out, mycugc.org, and see if there's a meeting in your area. And if you want to stay up to date, you can join um, by going to mycugc.org and opt in to receive communications. If there's not an event in your area, you can sign up to become a CUGC leader, uh, create a new group, or you can join an existing group. We're always looking for leaders. So with that said, it's time to get started. The man who really doesn't need an introduction, Jack Smith from Liquidware. Hey, thank you. All right, so let's get the uh, get my screen going. We're going to start with this. What we do as a company is we do three things. We have a visibility product called Stratosphere. We have a profile management solution called Profile Unity. And we have an application layering technology called FlexApp. Um, most of the conversation I'm going to have is probably more in the FlexApp arena. But the idea here is being able to go from a planning to onboarding to production with a full comprehensive toolkit that does all of those things. Now, where does Citrix come into play here? Well, we work with Citrix environments all the time. Uh, so whether that be web-based SaaS application settings or whatever that need to be saved as part of your you know, cookies and, and whatnot, or your desktop applications, non-persistent workstations, Linux desktops, mostly from a Stratosphere perspective, even remote PC type stuff, we're able to do that. We also work across various different clouds because we're not really managing the, the the hypervisor or the composer systems we're managing um windows and windows works within all of these various different clouds so we provide access to getting applications components pieces parts profile data whatever to any kind of cloud anywhere uh, whether that be on prem or off prem for Stratosphere, it's visibility into multiple different disciplines. So we're not just limited to seeing just what's going on in the Citrix environment, but we can also work on the physical workstation side of the house too, as well as Stratodesk, uh, Tenzig, and iGel terminals and Linux and Mac systems. So we kind of see literally everything about your environment uh, with the Stratosphere utilities. Within Profile Unity, there's multiple different things like a dynamic profile type that allows you to go between operating systems. So as you're going from Windows 10 to maybe 11 or the various different iterations of 10 or 16 to 19 to 22 or whatever mishmash of operating systems that you're working with, our dynamic profile allows you to go between all of those operating systems with a singular profile, as well as application management components, whitelist, blacklist, and soon to come masking, and then policy management, anything you can do in group policy, we can do. And then on top of that flex app, which we'll get into in a little bit, all of the items are contextually aware, which is which who, what, where, when, why, how. We have a lot of filters that say when these things happen, that is what you're going to get. We also have a profile disk. Yes, it is very similar to FS Logics. So if you're using an FS Logic container, that's fine. We work in conjunction with that to help uh, back up and maintain and restore said profiles if there is a profile corruption or uh, profile broken, as well as the, the management plane components and applications. Or if you'd alternatively like to use ours as well, that's that's fine. You can use this as an alternative to the FS Logics containers. That's perfectly fine. And we have all the same feature sets, multi-session environment disks, and all of all those types of things. We also help you go from wherever you are to wherever you are. So if you're on physical, go into cloud, or from an on-prem version of Citrix, going to a cloud version of Citrix, or have a mishmash of some physical and virtual and terminal servers, we have that as well. Um, we also have a free compacting tool available. If you go up on our website, 
you can compact VHD disks or VHDX disks down. This does work with not only our profile disk types, but also this will work with FSLogix containers. Uh, it is an executable with a million different options built into it, as well as kind of a scheduling thing and a, a bunch of different things. So it's worth a check out uh, if you guys are running into disk space issues. And I think that's going to be a topic today. This will help you shrink those things down. And it, it's free. Who doesn't like free stuff? We also have automation that was introduced this year. So we've got a lot of stuff going on uh, here at Liquidware as far as things that we're going to be bringing to the table. And uh, with automation, it's basically a main control plane that sends jobs out to multiple different node systems, compiles up these applications, and presents them to your inventory so that you can deliver them uh, however you need to deliver them with hopefully as little touch as possible. And the last big earth shaker that we added was a technology called FlexApp One. Now, what FlexApp One is, is the ability to take a FlexApp, encapsulate it within an executable so that you can now deliver this to any kind of workstation, whether that be an on-prem VDI environment or even a physical laptop environment. So we often get asked, hey, that's cool. That layering technology is really neat. But what about our laptops? Now we have a solution that actually can answer that question. And the major benefit of a FlexApp One versus obviously the traditional installation is it's already installed. And what I mean by that is you attach an application as if it is already installed. So for those applications that take forever to install, you know, those AutoCADs of the world are really big applications that can take a half an hour to uninstall and reinstall, and maybe it'll go sideways. This is attach and you have an application on your desktop in less than 30 seconds fully installed, ready to roll. So being that FlexApp One is kind of that last hump of, hey, we want physical, this answers that question and is part of your profile Unity licensing. And that is my five minutes. Thank you so much. And if I've got time, automation is very easy. You just hit enter and go. And it shoots the jobs out, packages up the applications for you, and you're done. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. Make sure to visit Liquidware's booth if you got any other questions. Jack's a rock star. Had a lot of interactions with him in the past. Oh, thanks. Ch <laughs> uh, chat with the staff, you know. Make sure to answer their poll question at their booth. And to kick us off today, we're going to take a look into the future. Not, not, not the past, but the future. Michael Rogers, he's a tech technology pioneer, an author, a journalist, who is also a future in residence at the New York Times. His consultancy, Pract The Practical Futurist, has worked with organizations ranging from NBC Universal, FedEx, mm -hmm. Boeing, GE, and Microsoft. Rogers studied physics and creative writing at Stanford University. His first job was at the Rolling Stone. He went on to co-found Outside Magazine and launched Newsweek's technology column. As vice president of the Washington Post's company, New Media Division, he earned several patents and won awards for his online coverage of September 11th. He lives in New York City and is also a best-selling novelist whose fiction explores the human impact of technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Rogers. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And let's see, do I have my slides? There they are. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here, here, I guess. So uh, it is a virtual environment, which I think you will find is quite apt for the, uh, the conversation I'm going to have today. Uh, you know, it's uh, IT professionals are my favorite audience because that's what I started out to be. Uh, I got distracted by writing partway through to my uh, engineering degree, but uh, I'm still still a great fan of the IT community and particularly the amazing stuff that you all did during the past 20 months to keep society more or less glued together virtually. Um, and, you know, I've been giving real speeches really since the middle of September, and I do enjoy that. But every once in a while, I get a real reminder of why we still have these virtual options. And it happened to me on Monday. I finished a live speech in Phoenix. It was great, good audience, lots of interaction. I liked that a lot. Got in the car, went to the airport, 
Turned out the power had been off at the Phoenix airport since 8.30 that morning. Uh, on Monday, literally by noon, people were hanging from the rafters, all the lines put out the door, planes were canceled, delayed. Let me just say Phoenix is a lovely city, uh, but you don't want to spend nine hours in the airport there. So this virtual thing is working really well for me today. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is the future, uh, how we've been shaped by and, and pushed forward by the last last two years of the pandemic. Um, the, the best way for me to frame it, I think, is to, oh dear, my slides are not advancing. Let's try this. Okay. <laughs> uh, after pandemics, societies often emerge with, with, with some real fundamental changes. For example, uh, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, uh, really, once it was over, it, it, it allowed the ar arising of the Renaissance, scientific medicine, uh, more recently, uh, the polio epidemic in the United States is, a, is an interesting case. You know, it really happened after World War II when we built suburbs and had a baby boom. Uh, it was a lot like COVID, not as widespread, but great deal of fear and rumors. Uh, one summer, the theory was that polio virus came in on banana skins. Another summer, the rumor was that the polio virus was being transmitted by house cats. So that was probably a really bad summer to be a house cat. Uh, ultimately, of course, 1954, Jonas Salk uh, brought out the polio vaccine, and by 1962, it was pretty much extinct in the United States. And I would argue that what came out of that, and some historians have suggested this also, is a real regard. The people in white coats, the scientists, the lab people were the heroes. They saved our children, and it truly shaped the attitudes towards science, science education, science funding. So I think it's no surprise that in the next two decades, we had the two best decades in American history, even to date, in science and technology. We basically invented the internet. Uh, that's the first two nodes of the internet there on the slide. We uh, invented the personal computer, created the sort of biochemistry and understanding for essentially all of the tools we use in genetic engineering today, and we landed a person on the moon. So that wasn't bad for 20 years. What I think we will see the COVID pandemic having pushed us into is the virtualization of the world. You know, virtualization is a word that has been common among the IT community for many years. Now it truly applies to the world. Everything that we do from shopping and work to education to meeting our mates is going into the cybersphere. Now that was already happening before COVID, but the pandemic forced us five years into the future. There's no doubt about it. And the technology wasn't ready. Uh, we all knew what was coming uh, over the rest of the decade, I think, but we thought there'd be kind of an orderly march towards this uh, this work from home sort of thing. Um, didn't turn out that way. And uh, we got pushed five years into the future. Uh, you all became essential workers, uh, usually overloaded. And at the end of the day, I can say that, it, you know, the, probably the biggest breakthrough is that now everyone in the United States over 40 knows how to unmute themselves on Zoom. Non-trivial, that's, that's really gonna help things. And next year, maybe we'll work on the look into the camera part of it as well. So the virtualization of the world, you know, people are not going back to the office, uh, not in the numbers that were initially expected. Uh, and we're going to have hybrid workplaces. There's just absolutely no doubt about that. The real winners, I think, in the next decade will be the ones who figure out what can move into the virtual world, what must stay in the real world, and most importantly, how you connect between them. Now, this is a problem we've been trying to solve in, in the business world for some time. There's, um, you know, this is an early 
uh, telepresence conference room. And some of you may have worked on these. Uh, they work really well, actually, uh, but they cost, as I recall, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, and you know had a lot of hardware floating around. Uh, of course, it's gotten much easier and cheaper to do this today. You can put together the pretty equivalent telepresence kind of room um, with you know some plywood sheets and some very inexpensive screens. Uh, of course, we're going to keep going. Um, this is one of my favorite things that happened during the pandemic was, of course, the real idea is how are we going to effectively connect uh, the worker at home with the uh, with the office? And you know, some of you may remember the telepresence robot, uh, which was supposed to be used by, say, the CEO to go tour the distant offices. And most CEOs, I think, believed did not think that was a great idea. Uh, so it's now was trialed a number of places as a way to connect the worker at home to the workers in the office. So we'll see if this technology comes back around again. Of course, ultimately, uh, there's the notion of ambient telepresence, where quite literally one wall of the office becomes a giant video screen that is attached and uh, to via cameras. Uh, the, another office, 5,000 miles away, potentially. This is a kind of an artist's rendition of that. I've seen it done in real life. I saw an office once in Palo Alto that was connected to an office in Portland, Oregon via ambient telepresence, and it was in the coffee room. You'd walk into the coffee room, normal coffee lounge, table, chairs, coffee pot. Uh, one wall was a giant projection screen, 8K, very high resolution, uh, you know, very localized audio. On that screen was uh, an identical coffee lounge, the one in Oregon, and uh, the walls were painted the same color, the carpet was the same color, and you know, you'd walk in and a colleague in Oregon would walk out uh, life size and you'd drink your coffee, have your water cooler moment and then go back to the office. Uh, and that was a profound uh, bit of work, I think. Uh, in fact, they discovered that for certain projects, it was as if all the workers were in the same physical space. So that's out on the horizon. Even a little further out on the horizon are, of course, smart glasses. This is uh, someone's imaginary mock-up of the uh, Apple glasses that are rumored to be coming. I know my friends at Apple say that it's early. They hope it's the next iPhone. Um, I've been telling them for years that they should do smart glasses because they can call them eyeglasses. It's perfect. So maybe, maybe they'll do that. Uh, but I do believe that by the end of this decade, at least some of our workers, part of the time, will be wearing smart glasses. Uh, there's just no doubt about that. And that will open up a whole lot of new possibilities, I think, for integrating workers at home into the office. You know, it gets uh, very, very metaverse to use uh, Mark Zuckerberg's new word that he borrowed from Snow Crash, uh, where it was used in a somewhat more satirical way. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. But uh, the HR department, I think, is going to be much more involved with IT than they used to be because we've got a number of issues. Uh, the worker at home, uh, I've already spoken to labor lawyers who say this is going to be a cornucopia of new labor questions, such as how do you deal with harassment? Uh, what about ergonomics? Uh, and of course, cybersecurity. What is the overall responsibility of the business to take care of the full-time employee at home. So lots and lots of, of work there. The other piece that the uh, HR department is going to be struggling with is this notion of how you keep a culture going. How do you keep a corporate culture going when people are maybe coming and going from the office, not spending all their time in the office, uh, and many people perhaps don't come to the office at all. Uh, so that's led to this notion uh, that is just sort of coming current now. It was originally coined by an article in the Harvard Business Review of digital campfires. The idea being that a campfire is something that uh, you go to for a purpose. You stay warm, there's light, 
But at the same time, you have conversations with the people around you, not necessarily about the campfire. It's a socializing mechanism. Now, of course, the water cooler is another example. So we could be talking about the digital water cooler. No one quite knows what that is going to be, but there's a lot of work trying to figure it out. One interesting model that people are looking at is the way that Twitch, the gaming platform, uh, has really created you know, quite a social experience around watching uh, live gaming. And that very often the social experience is more important uh, than watching the live gaming itself. Uh, now the example that everyone uses is uh, AOC's adoption of uh, Twitch. She played the game. Um, uh, uh, in a stream that I believe had about 400,000 viewers uh, simultaneously. And there was just a lot of conversation going on, very effective use of Twitch. So Twitch probably not is, the cor is not the corporate solution, but may well have some implications for how we do create ways to, cre to keep this kind of corporate culture going. Um, there will still be the physical office. The physical office will be used much more, of course, for collaboration. Uh, you won't come into the physical office to sit in a cubicle, although sometimes you might want to. So I think we're going to see uh, This is an office prototype, uh, I believe, at Google headquarters in Mountain View. And it can be completely reconfigured in a weekend to create conference rooms, to create conversation spaces to create cubicles. That's the uh, HVAC system hanging from the ceiling there, the white tubes. You can even reconfigure how the HVAC works. All of that, you transform an entire floor plate in a weekend. So that kind of flexibility, I think, is what we're going to need in the workplace. Same thing is going to happen in retail, flexibility. We're learning to detach ourselves from the overwhelming importance of the material world in some ways. Now, the pop-up store was around, of course, before COVID, but it tended to be high fashion uh, or you know, youth marketing, that sort of thing. Now we're starting to see, at least in New York and uh, Los Angeles, the two places I've really studied it, a lot of empty commercial real estate being marketed as pop-ups, pop-up space, because more and more companies have figured out how to have a stable, successful business using their physical presence for delivery, pickup, that sort of thing, and uh, only need uh, a physical presence for you know real customer interaction on an occasional basis, hence the pop-up. And pop-ups are even being considered as things to build originally. It's not just repurposing old commercial uh, real estate, but actually building new kinds of structures that are specifically made to be highly flexible and uh, pop-ups. Uh, a good final example, I think, of um, how virtualization has changed our, our notions of the physical world is medicine. You know, the COVID pandemic really made telemedicine happen. Uh, we'd had it for a long time, but there were always, uh, the insurers weren't always paying for it. There were complicated state regulations. All of a sudden in COVID, it was clear, whoa, we have got to have telemedicine. So telemedicine happened. The insurers started to pay for it. And it turned out the patients loved it. Not all patients, and it's not appropriate for all situations, but it is pretty clear that telemedicine is a very efficient way to deal with quite a few kinds of doctor visits, and the patients like it. And indeed, the care providers are getting to like it too. Uh, so that's, of course, leading people to say, well, how much further can we go with virtual medicine? This is a, a prototype uh, drawing of a of a remote diagnostic booth. This is a, the idea is you might set this up in a school or a pharmacy, uh, a, a factory, an office building, or you might actually set it up so that it's portable and can go around. And the purpose of it is to actually provide a much deeper 
telemedicine experience. There's a screen, of course, that lets the physician um, appear on screen and have the conversation, but there's a lot of extremely high-tech uh, sensor devices that do everything from you know temperature and uh, blood sugar to, you know, it uses things like sweat analysis, uh, all kinds of microassays, quite interesting and sophisticated stuff. So again, that's how far we could go with the virtualization of these things. And then finally, of course, this is just something that I use with healthcare providers to say, and here are how many individual devices can possibly feed in to the telemedicine experience. And these are quite primitive compared to what we'll have in five years or so. Uh, this is also, of course, uh, an, something that the IT world is deeply concerned about. I mean, the arguments of, you know, bring your own device uh, of the last decade are pretty much over. It's clear that everyone is going to have a lot of devices connected to the network in various ways. And security, which I'll talk about in a moment, is going to just be a bigger and bigger issue. The other piece that we're coming back to that's going to be very influential is cognitive computing. Many of you may recognize this 2016 photograph of uh, the world champion Go player being beaten uh, four games out of five by the DeepMind computer a company subsequently bought by, by Google. Um, and this, of course, used neural networks and cognitive computing software to have two computers essentially play each other at Go, this incredibly complicated 391 piece game, play it over and over and over again until they got really good at it. And then one of them played the champion and beat him. Uh, and no one expected this till 2030. Go is incredibly complicated. You know, there's 20 possible opening moves in chess. Uh, there's 391 in Go. Uh, even Go masters are quite vague about teaching how Go works. Anyway, uh, the interesting quote to me was from another Go master who watched this and said at the end, it's as if we're seeing another intelligent species that sees the world differently, but as well as we do. So that's led to things like you know, cognitive computing in um, the legal profession. Uh, increasingly, I find that uh, the big law firms I work with are beginning to wonder exactly what do we do with young associates who used to do the research and uh, discovery and uh, contract drafting when there's more and more AI out there that does all of those things very well. In the case of discovery, it's actually argued that computers do a more careful job of discovering evidence in vast quantities of corporate documents than, than humans do. Uh, the other piece that cognitive computing has given us is, I think, uh, much smarter robotics. Uh, it's become so much easier, both in terms of software and hardware. Uh, this is uh, a drive-in window at McDonald's in Chicago. And what they've done is the first step McDonald's did with their drive-in windows was to uh, make some of them remotely staffed. In other words, the drive-in window in Chicago, it might be someone in Wisconsin sitting at home who was actually taking the orders. And that was a big step and that worked okay. Uh, then uh, during the pandemic, the question came up, why don't we just get a really good customer service bot to do this. So it's being trialed now in Illinois, and one manager has said, well, the customer service bots seem to work really well, and they you know, have nice, pleasant human voices, and they don't get sick, uh, they don't fail to show up for work, and they are always in a good mood. So we'll see where that goes. Um, Cashierless checkouts is going to truly change what the front of stores look like. Uh, our push in the recent time to go towards contactless payment in uh, the COVID pandemic uh, is something that I think probably the governments of the world are going to uh, continue to push. They are pretty happy actually to see cash going away. Cash uh, is troublesome for a variety of reasons, mainly tax evasion and uh, the criminal underground. So uh, cashless payment is very much a part of the future. 
Um, and then finally, in robotics, uh, cognitive computing, I think you can argue, has pushed us really forward on a couple things that, that, that kept robotics out of light in industrial applications. One is vision. Robot vision is much, much better now. And the second is text tactility, the ability you know, to manipulate small objects in a careful way, to not break things. So it's resulted in some very interesting new robotics. This is a hamburger robot uh, in San Francisco. Some of you may have been to the restaurant that used it. It was called Concept. It's south of Market. The last time I checked, it, it had closed during the pandemic. But it used a robot that ultimately they wanted to sell to the fast food industry. This is one of their hamburgers. It cost $7.50. It was almost entirely robot made. They, it broke up the lettuce, it cut the tomatoes, it sliced the buns, it even mixed the meat for you. And it was a great hamburger. And the amazing thing about it is it got 4.5 stars on Yelp. And in San Francisco, that's almost impossible since everyone knows everything about food. Finally, I have to show you this from the summer. This was the first successful test of a raspberry harvesting robot. Um, in Europe, this happened in the UK, there's much less access to migrant labor. So there's quite a bit more reliance on agricultural robotics. They're a good bit ahead of us in that. So this is the hardest fruit to harvest, I'm told. So that's why the, uh, the folks decided to try this one. This robot uh, moves more slowly than a human being. But, um, it has four arms and it also works all night long because it can see in the dark. So it basically harvests 25,000 raspberries in a work day, uh, considerably more than a human does. Uh, we'll see where that goes, but that's a pretty good example of, uh, ultimately, of course, there's cobots. Now with the better tactility, the better vision, it really looks like having collaborative robots with humans is going to be increasingly safe and insurable. So. Uh, another piece that uh, is hinted at, I think, in my, uh, my talk about the uh, um, the, uh, the medical sensors is the whole rise of the Internet of Things. This is, of course, a huge change. I've never liked Internet of Things. I thought that's kind of vague. It's, it's smart sensors. And it's amazing what we can do with smart sensors now in terms of a tiny bit of silicon that measures everything from velocity and pressure to, as I said earlier, blood sugar and you name it. Um, on a little, another little chip, you know, connected is a, a radio that then puts all that information um, onto the network. Uh, I remember people used to ask me, who changes the batteries in these little tiny radios? But as many of you probably know, the next generation of smart sensors is a lot of it is energy harvesting. Uh, the bridge in this slide has sensors that detect icing as long before a human or a video camera would pick up icing on the surface. And that those sensors are powered by the uh, flexing of the bridge as tires go over it. Uh, the industrial settings or the office are great places for smart sensors because you can basically harvest all the excess uh, radio frequency energy around you um, and recycle that. Uh, because these devices, of course, use very, very small amounts of current and they're usually in mesh networks, so they don't have to transmit that far. Uh, so energy harvesting is here to stay. You know, my favorite story about smart sensors, one of the first uses I saw for them was almost a decade ago in Europe, where there was a four nation consortium that uh, was building smart dumpsters. Because in, in Europe, because of the narrow streets in a lot of the old cities, there's a premium on trash collection being efficient. So uh, there was this project to create smart dumpsters that would tell the oncoming garbage truck, don't pick me up, keep going, or I'm almost full, you better stop, and create some efficiencies in how garbage was collected. 
Um, I was in Europe uh, about a year ago again and wanted to check in on how smart dumpsters were going. Well, it turns out that uh, there are now five companies competing in the smart dumpster space. It's a very hot market. Uh, and one of them actually as a publicity stunt uh, gave every single one of their dumpsters a Twitter feed. So I was really excited. I got on Twitter and I looked at what was going on and uh, the, uh, there it was, you know, a Twitter feed that came from a dumpster in Copenhagen. I am a dumpster in Copenhagen. I'm on the docks. It's 24 degrees Celsius. I'm one third full. And it turns out that's really all a dumpster has to say. So my excitement abated. But I figure if you can make a dumpster smart, you can do just about anything. So, and that's going to lead to, uh, this has got to be someone's nightmare, but it's also a dream of corporate supply officials because this is what's called the supply line control tower where you've managed to instrument so many things. You've got sensors and interconnects with everyone in your supply chain that you can create a screen like this that basically in real time tells you exactly what's going on with your supply chain. Now, this is an idea that's been around for a while, but once again, the pandemic has really pushed it into the forefront because as any of you involved with it know, supply chains have just fallen apart. We know how fragile they are now. Uh, in many cases, they're being rethought and rebuilt. And when they, that happens, it's going to be with the ultimate goal of having something like this, having something like the, uh, the, this dashboard for the supply chain. Big, big changes there in the supply chain as well. A final thing that smart sensors and artificial intelligence are going to have an impact on uh, is, the, uh, is the whole notion of workplace safety. This is probably the first digital workplace safety sign. Uh, I have talked recently with one of the companies that makes industrial safety signs. You know, you basically buy their safety signs and it meets all the workers' comp requirements for signs, they're not satisfied with them because the saying in the business says is that um, after 30 days, any safety sign, no matter how nicely you make it, becomes wallpaper. So the notion of where do we go, it clearly leads to digital signage. Digital signage is getting to be very, very cheap. Um, and of course, wherever you have a digital sign, you're going to put a camera in there. It's connected to the web. The camera doesn't cost anything much to put in. Of course, there'll be a camera. So the safety sign of the future will probably be digital screens with cameras that are connected to an AI somewhere. And when you approach, it's going to take a look at you and realize you don't have your hard hat on and remind you that you're entering an area that uh, requires a hard hat. Or it looks at you and says, you know, you actually don't have the right training to enter this room, which controls some seriously dangerous equipment. So the door is not going to be unlocked for you. So this kind of digital safety sign we'll see more and more and more of. Um, to make all this work, one of the big questions of this upcoming decade is standards. Uh, how do we make all this stuff interconnected? Uh, not just within our own companies, but in the case of the supply chain between, you know, potentially 15 different vendors that are involved in this whole process. Uh, many, many examples like that. And, you know, Many years ago, the IT industry was not good about standards. You know, the old joke back in the personal computer era was the personal computer business loves standards. They have so many of them. But of course, that's not the point. You don't want a whole lot of standards, and that slowed us down for a long time. But standards are coming, cross-industry standards, and many of you are probably already involved in the process of creating these. Uh, in healthcare, in finance. The example that I like, because it's a really big dream, uh, it's gonna take a long time to get there, is building information modeling in the construction industry. The idea being that you know, each element 
each piece of physical hardware that goes into a building has a unique digital identifier, a meta tag or whatever it gets called in the standards that everyone adopts. So that a doorknob manufactured in New Hampshire has a standard digital identification that starts out when the architect specifies it in the blueprints, it's in the blueprints or construction drawings that then when it's time to get bids goes out to all the hardware suppliers who use exactly the same digital code. So where once you would have a whole team that went through a building to figure build a building project to figure out what the bill of materials was going to cost, now you can do it in an hour with a computer. So someone starts building the building and then this is the part I like, the construction documents become essentially a living document. They're connected to the internet, of course, and let's say that doorknob manufacturer up in New Hampshire decides to change the specs on the doorknob. Uh, just a little bit, just an inch or so here or there. Uh, when they do that, of course, that changes the meta tag, which is immediately transmitted through the internet to anyone who is using that doorknob in a construction project. And a little note pops up that says, "You, the manufacturers changed the spec on this doorknob. You better take a look. So in the old days, of course, the doorknob would have shown up on trucks probably after you drilled the holes in the doors and it wouldn't fit and it would be a mess. So the potential for this building information modeling, I think, really shows how there's multiple benefits to adopting standards that uh, cut across uh, every individual company in a given sector. Uh, there, of course, for years and years, standards were resisted because very often they provided a competitive advantage. But in the world of networking that we're going into in this decade, if you don't fit into the network with your standards, then you're out of business. So standards are coming and it's a good thing. Um, that leads me to uh, the other another thing that we saw really come up quickly, I think, in the public imagination, at least during COVID, was uh, cryptocurrency. I mean, it had been a big thing before. Uh, among other things, I think we had so many people working at home that who realized they could multitask as day traders in cryptocurrency that that really sort of fanned the flames. Uh, my feeling is that uh, the jury is still out on most of the coins that we're seeing bought and sold now. The other shoe that's going to drop is when um, all of the nations of the world begin to itch, issue their own digital currencies. Of course, China has started. Every Western democracy is thinking about it. Um, so if you have most of the advantages of uh, cryptocurrency in terms of ease of use in a digital currency that is backed by a government, um, why do you use Bitcoin? And that actually, or any other sort of semi-anonymous, not truly anonymous, but more anonymous than regular, than, um, than uh, the electronic transactions we have now. Um, in the end, I think most governments will say that they're not that crazy about the idea of anonymous digital cash because it will create the biggest tax evasion system ever seen. But in the meantime, uh, the good thing about cryptocurrency as a craze is that it has really accelerated the acceptance of blockchain and the excitement about things like smart contracts. Uh, a lot of work is being done there. The smart contracts fit perfectly into this idea of standardized networks of suppliers or um, and you know, supply chains, anything like that. It, it, it really is going to fit together. I think one of the biggest difficulties I see is that blockchain um, and similar distributed ledger systems really were at the very early stages of figuring out the security questions there. So that, that may be a bit of, of, of a problem, but that does lead to security. So I'm gonna, talk a bit about this because this, of course, is top of everyone's mind. And I have to say, it's top of everyone's mind in a way that it wasn't 15 years ago. Uh, and that right there is progress. I have to say I am more optimistic in this decade about the potential to, to really make 
the virtual world secure and safe than I was, say, five years ago, when I thought it would take a major digital disaster on the order of 9-11 to make people sit up and take notice. I mean, we've had, we've had plenty of big, big digital problems, and that's helped a lot. But I do think that, that finally the corporate world has figured out that this is crucially important. And I think the two big players that we'll see coming in in this next decade are, first of all, the, the government. There is going to be more regulation. There's just no doubt about it. Um, you know, the internet is at least as important as the federal highway system. So while we don't need as many laws and regulations as the federal highway system has, the federal government should probably take some responsibility for uh, seeing uh, a little bit more about making sure that we've got good security. The, the second force I see coming in is insurance companies because What's happened in you know the executive suites and boards of directors is, you know, they're rightly saying, "My gosh, you know, we're facing potentially enormous liabilities from cyber risk. Uh, we insure everything else. Well, why don't we insure for cyber risk?" And of course, IT people will say, "Well, there are policies for cyber risk. Um, insurance companies are a little dubious about." Uh, writing them because they don't know the extent of loss that might be involved. And the experience of some folks in IT is that you do have uh, an event and it turns out that your insurance doesn't cover it for one reason or another. So it's not been a big, a, a big part of insurance. I believe it will be. The insurers definitely want to provide good cyber risk insurance. I think what we may end up with, hypothetically, is something similar to what happened with workers' compensation at the beginning of the 20th century. The government really wanted workers to be safer in factories, but didn't want to do all the work themselves. So they created the workers' compensation system in which the insurers basically handled the claims and wrote the policies based on government regulations, usually. Uh, I already know insurance companies getting together now to look at questions of how do you create standards of insurability that a corporate uh, entity needs to meet in order to have an insurance policy. So it's going to be messy. It's not going to be simple anytime this kind of thing goes on, but I'm feeling much more optimistic about where we go. You know, the, the one other piece that I would say is going to be helpful is firm digital identities. This will fit into all the digital identity work that's being done in the private sector now, but it just seems inevitable that by the end of this decade, most of the users of the internet in the developed world will have some form of official or officially recognized digital identity, some biometric probably attached to some other key, uh, details to come, but the equivalent of a driver's license or a passport, uh, you know, very hard to spoof uh, and is simplifying the way that we handle uh, security. It, it's not going to solve everything, but it should make things a little easier uh, to at least have that kind of ID going. And in countries that have adopted this kind of digital idea, ID, uh, Estonia, being sort of the, the best example. It's surprising how well it works. You know, Estonia's had some incidents because it's got a neighbor, Russia, that is very good at hacking and hates Estonia. So they, back in 2007, were the victims of really the first major cyber attack. But Estonia, through that digital identity card, you know, manages all the health in information, for example, down to the level of do you want to be buried or cremated? And even in all the hacking that has been undergone in Estonia, there's been very, very little leakage of personal information. So digital, firm digital identities, I think, are really going to help us going forward. Finally, uh, just a quick word from my experience, um, the notion of research and development. Um, and sort of frame this, uh, I helped start the R&D group at the New York Times. And 
at the time we started it, people said, that's crazy. What does a newspaper need with an R&D group? <laughs> and the, it turned out to be very, very, very useful. And at this point, uh, almost 15 years after the R&D group started, the New York Times is actually in pretty good shape for a print newspaper. And certainly some of it is due to the input from the R&D group. So what does an R&D group do um, in a non-technology company or in, for example, an IT group? The key is having someone who is detached from operational duties, at least part of the time, to look ahead, to see what's coming up, uh, to test new technologies long before a vendor shows up to actually try to sell it to you. Um, this back in you know 10 years ago or so in the publishing industry, everyone was trying to sell technology to paper publications. Uh, and a lot of them were just buying things willy-nilly that turned out to not be good ideas. The R&D group was able, in our case, to go out and look at things and come back and say, yeah, we really could use this, or let's think about this later. Um, but also, we had the time to create prototypes, sometimes even physical prototypes of how these new technologies could work, that we would take back and show to the stakeholders within the company. What do you think of this? Is this crazy? Is this, what would you do with it? Or to create buy-in for, um, you know, changes that were going to affect workflows. And all of this was because we had the time to do that. It's a cost, it's an actual real cost to have even one person set aside without operational duties. But operational duties always get in the way of, I think, really open exploration and consideration of what's coming next. So that's, that's my pitch for uh, what I call the R&D mindset. Um, so I'll conclude with just sort of one, thought from, um, this is the novelist Tolstoy. Uh, Tolstoy was in his 80s at the end of the 19th century, right about the time that the Lumiere brothers in Paris uh, invented the motion picture. Actually, they invented the first sort of semi-portable motion picture camera. And uh, it was <laughs> barely portable. It was like the size of a small refrigerator and only shot 12 or 15 seconds of film at a time. But they took it around and they made movies. And one of their most famous 12 to 15 second movies was called Train Pulling Into Station. Uh, we've actually gotten better at naming movies since then. But uh, the film was simple. They set up this camera next to a train track. And the whole film was it began and you saw this train out in the distance, a tiny dot coming closer and closer and closer and closer at high speed, and then suddenly it zooms past you. And that's the whole film. When they showed it, uh, often people sitting in the front row would fall out of their chairs because they'd never seen anything like this. And just instinctively, it looked like something was coming at you and about to hit you. So <laughs> it was truly a, a film that was a big hit. And the Lumiere brothers took it around to the capitals of Europe, uh, ended up in Moscow at one time, and Tolstoy came to visit. And Tolstoy, it is said, did not fall out of his chair, but did say, aha, I was born 50 years too soon. Well, none of this uh, audience, none of us sitting here today can say the, the same thing. Tolstoy was lamenting, I think, the fact that this change, this new medium that could be so powerful for uh, storytelling, even though he was a master of written prose, this new technology was so alluring that he really wished he could be there to help adapt it and make use of it. Now, I don't think any of us uh, can say that we were born 50 years too soon because it's very, very clear that these changes accelerated by the pandemic are going to snowball throughout 
the rest of this decade. And it's going to be up to uh, the IT community in particular to stay ahead of it and to make the best of it. So uh, with that, um, I wish you a great remainder of the conference. And uh, it's been, been very good to have this chance to talk to you. And finally, thanks once again to all of you for getting us through uh, the last 20 months. Thank you. Wow. wow. Thanks, Michael. thanks, Michael. That was incredibly insightful. Uh, next up, we have an introduction yeah. to new tactics. Welcome to today's session, Nutanix Technical Introductions in Five Minutes or Less. My name is Kees Bauhamam, and I'm a technical director for end user computing within Nutanix. Um, I've got a blog, a Twitter feed, and an email stream. If you want to hit me up with questions later on, then feel free to do so. Now, if you look at Nutanix as a uh, company, you'd see that we have uh, one platform for any app and any cloud where there's a, a strong focus on long-term sustainable growth uh, with multiple products, um, both on, on the platform, on the application and cloud agnostic side. Um, we've defined the four Ds within our portfolios. So we started off with digital hyper, hyperconverged infrastructure services. That's our bread and butter. That's where our virtualization, our storage management and operation and security is hosted. Then we've um, designed the data center services business unit that uh, holds the storage components of objects and um, uh, other storage related um, services, networking and business continuity and disaster recovery. Then there's DevOps services that will offer cloud native applications, automation with Calm, our automation and orchestration lifecycle management, and there's a database as a service as well. And last but not least, there's a business unit called Desktop Services, and that will cover end user computing, DAS, and digital workspace. All of that, uh, we do that across both private cloud and public cloud, and that's where, uh, where I wanted to talk to you about today. So if we look at the case for hybrid cloud deployments, um, we actually saw that based on IDC uh, and enterprise cloud index, um, that 85% of the enterprises continue to rank that hybrid cloud model as the ideal operating model. 73% um, of the respondents were migrating applications away from public cloud back to an on-premises infrastructure. And 60% of the respondents said that security was the biggest factor impacting enterprises uh, future for cloud strategies. And if you combine all of that, um, obviously Nutanix uh, always had a stronghold in the on-prem data center solutions with our HCI uh, core foundation. But looking forward, um, it would make sense to kind of offer something that enables you to uh, build a bridge to hybrid cloud. And that's basically what we're doing. So if we specify this for end user computing and we're looking to, uh, to that one workload a little bit closer, you would see that uh, our, our hyperconverged infrastructure is a perfect match for uh, desktop services. Uh, being server VDAs or, or desktop VDAs doesn't really matter. Private cloud and public cloud operated by the same management plane, same look and feel, and the same tool set that you would use on-prem and, and in public cloud, simplifying your deployment, simplifying your golden image management, which has always been a tough uh, situation to, uh, to be in. If you leverage on-premises solutions and you burst into public cloud, then you have to do image management for each and every public cloud, um, spread it across regions. Um, it it kind of inherent uh, complexity when you look at it. And we as Nutanix can simplify that. Now, how are we simplifying this? Um, looking at the integration points that we have, um, we've got a plugin for MCS. So if you look at the hypervisors that we support, um, it's uh, vSphere, ESX, um, it's Microsoft Hyper-V, and there's Nutanix AHV. And Nutanix AHV is our own built-in hypervisor. And together with Citrix, we developed a joint solution uh, to deliver the uh, provisioning methodologies from Citrix onto Nutanix AHV. And for that, we created an MCS plugin. Um, we've created the PVS plugin. So you can utilize both M MCS and PVS on our platform. And there's a CVAT service plugin via Prism. And last but not least, uh, there's a plugin for, di for director as well, which 
enables you to kind of get the details of your AHV uh, underlying platform and get the, the performance details that you need. So all in all, if we look at uh, how we differentiate for end user computing, it's the platform of your choice. So pick your own broker, version, hypervisor, and platform. Doesn't matter which uh, hardware vendor you're, uh, you're, uh, you're preferring. Uh, we have a, a OEM model that helps you define uh, and, and pick the right uh, platform for you. There's a per user pricing model to match infrastructure costs to the EUC licensing models that we see in the field. Linear scalability, and this is something that, um, that I think is, is very valuable. So we can scale from hundreds to 10,000 VMs with linear performance. And we've ha we have that documented in our reference architectures. We've got videos on YouTube. Um, so please have a look and, and um, see for yourself. And last but not least, we have a complete end user computing solution. So people always um, look at uh, end user computing as a uh, fully assembled stack. And that's what Nutanix is doing with integrated file shares, uh, security with our network segmentation called Flow, and now clusters as well. So building that hybrid bridge is something that, uh, that we're dedicated to. And with that, I'd like to thank you. If you're interested in our technology stack or just want to hear more, uh, we've got a virtual booth with the Nutanix team waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you, Nutanix. Make sure to visit their booth. If you, have, if you need more information, chat with their staff, answer the poll question, and be entered for prizes. Next up, we got iGel. Now, I bet when you think of iGel, you think of these little black boxes sitting in offices or sitting in dusty back rooms or even sitting in factories, providing access to an ancient on-premises Citrix estate. Well, it's not the iGel of today, and it hasn't been the iGel of the past few years either. At iGel now, it's all about the edge operating system. It's all about providing a secure and sustainable OS to get access to your Citrix estate, whether or not it's on-premises or more likely now in the cloud. So we have multiple reasons for iGel OS to be used in a, an enterprise environment. We've got a really secure read-only operating system. We have a very, very simple management infrastructure, which means you can manage devices, even if they are still in the office, or if they're being used remotely. We have the ability to temporarily convert BYO devices to become managed, fully managed devices and fully managed operating systems while that user is accessing your Citrix estate. And we also provide you the ability to reuse existing and potentially older devices so you can stop a lot of old hardware, a lot of old equipment being sent to landfill. So let's have a look at these different use cases and let's tie them all together into one key use case. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like to reuse a really old thin client. In this case, it's a Dell 5020. This thing is about five to six years old. And I'm gonna show you booting up using UD Pocket into iGel OS and then what that means for the enterprise. So what I've done here is put a UD Pocket into the Dell 5020 and turned it on. The first thing this Dell 5020 is going to do is have a look at its USB ports and then see that there's an iGel OS device in there. So it will boot into iGel OS. And you can see here I'm running 1106.100, which as at the time of um, speaking is the latest version. So that then boots into iGel OS. Now this has been completely configured using our UMS or Universal Management Suite. And you can see on the bottom right hand corner, I've got a little cloud that at the moment has got a line going through it. As soon as that line disappears, when it gets network connectivity, it means that this device is now connected to our ICG or iGel Cloud Gateway. And that means we can now manage this device no matter what network it's on. It doesn't have to be on a VPN. This device can be completely managed over the air. So you can see I've got the Citrix icon there. I can just double click on the Citrix icon and then log in to Citrix, into the Citrix workspace. And now you can see all my published applications and my VDI desktops. So I simply need to go down. In this case, I'm going to click on Server 2019. That should then run my Server 2019 published desktop. So that's going to load, and that's logging on to the Citrix estate. And then here we go. We have a desktop that looks and feels like Windows 10 because it's been skipped. It's as easy as that, though, to get access to reuse this old hardware. Now, imagine that was a home user's device. Imagine that was a BYO device that was sitting at home that a remote worker was using. Now, usually what you'd want to do is try to manage that device. And that might be through 
um, a unified endpoint management agent, maybe from Intune potentially. But a lot of users, especially when it comes to BYO devices, don't want their devices to be managed in any way. The beauty of the iGel solution is that you can simply take a UD Pocket or the end user, the remote worker, can take a UD Pocket and then put it into their device and boot up into iGel OS and get access to their Citrix estate without making any changes to the hard drive or the operating system on their device. That means whenever they need to get access to the Citrix estate, they simply plug the device in, boot it up, and then for the duration of their session, everything is managed by the organization. Their device is managed and the operating system is managed. Then at the end of that, they can simply remove the UD pocket, reboot their device, and then get access to the operating system that was already there, whether it's Windows 10 or Windows 11 or Mac OS. It's all back to exactly the way it was before they put in the UD pocket. So not only do you have security around that, you have the, the fact that while that device is in use for accessing your systems, you completely secure it. You also have the simplicity of managing using the iGel Cloud Gateway and the Universal Management Suite. You can push down policies in real time to that endpoint device. You can get a, a device inventory, an asset inventory. You can tell exactly what's happening on that device. And also, when it comes to reusing devices, as you just saw with that example of the 5020, instead of sending that device to landfill or sending it to be recycled, you can extend the life of that device, saving money on procurement and also protecting the environment. So iGel is absolutely a valid solution in the enterprise, especially when it comes to consuming the, your Citrix environment. Thank you, iGel. Don't forget to visit their booth to interact with their staff and answer their poll question for a chance to win a prize. Up next, I'd like to introduce three Citrix technology advocates, Ray Davis, Casper Johansson, and Mike Streaks. They will have a panel discussion about FS logics and storage, moderated by CTP Patrick Coble. Throughout the discussion, don't forget to engage on the chat, put any questions in the Q&A tab, and the more engagement, the more visibility, the higher your chance of winning a prize. One. Hope everyone's doing good today. Yes, doing well. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, you're sounding good. Ray, how are you sounding? Oh, you got to unmute on that thing. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Casper, how about you? Uh, hopefully I'm going through okay. You are good. Right. All right, cool. Well, does everyone want to do like a quick intro? Mike, we'll start up there at the top left there, and we'll go around, ring around the Rosie. So, cool. Uh, and then we'll uh, get into this profile FS logic goodness. Hey, I'm Mike Streets. I am a VDI architect. Uh, I've been in the Citrix consulting space for, oh, the last 10 years or so. Um, the last seven of which have been spent in the US, and prior to that, as you might be able to tell from my accent in Australia. Um, I work with Citrix virtual apps and desktops uh, frequently doing upgrades, optimizations. Um, I work with uh, FS Logics quite a lot doing FS Logics implementations um, and many other profile solutions which uh, we'll, we'll get into the differences between UPM and FS Logics as well. Um, but yeah, you can see my Twitter bio, you can see my profile, go check out my LinkedIn. There's tons of information in there if you want to know more about me. So I'm Ray Davis. Um, I'm a senior system engineer. I work for uh, Vicer Credit Union. I guess you can say I'm a client, an end user. Um, I've been doing Citrix for 12 years now. And then heavily got into it about 10 years ago. Um, so I support the Citrix virtual apps from desktops, Netscalers, all basically pretty much everything. And then um, we use FS Logic pretty heavily. Um, so that's that's about it. All right. Yeah, and I'm the the European guy here, or Danish guy, so to say. Um been working as a consultant for almost 15 years now, uh, mainly with Citrix, also in the remote desktop service space. Um, I've been actually been working with FS Logics since way before they were acquired by, by Microsoft. Uh, and I actually think I did some of the first 
installations here in Denmark. So hopefully I have, I have some tips and tricks to share with you today. Yeah, cool. No, and uh, I'm Patrick Koble. I'm the VDI hacker nerd, and uh, I'm trying to wrangle these crazy people here as we talk about FS logics here. So uh, I think the first thing we had down was, you know, what type of profile type um, should we be picking? And I know, you know, a lot of this FS logics profile stuff is definitely uh, it's always in a, a consulting. It depends, right? Um, and so I think everyone has had different experiences with it. And so picking that right profile type and then some of the settings within the profile uh, is going to make or break many deployments. Yeah. Um, as, an, as a client, we use, we have EDI and we have published apps. So in the beginning of this, I set the Zen desktop side to use direct access, which worked great. Um, and then I had a, another colleague of mine that come and he basically al allowed the double hop scenario where they would go into their virtual desktop and let's say they didn't have the applications installed within that virtual desktop because it was like a core banking app for whatever. So he installed a receiver and then he would, you know, they launched the published app and basically, you know, because it's in direct access mode, it's not going to use a, a read only or a fallback option. So what would happen is it for like five intervals for 60 seconds a piece, it would try and try and try. And, you know, the app, the user wouldn't see nothing other than uh, they basically get a timeout if they even got an error message. So in my situation, we had to enable um, profile type three, which allowed us to do a read write disk and fell back to a read only disk for use cases like that. Um, it, it does, it seems to work. Okay. I have, I have seen some, some issues where, um, depending on the back end storage where it doesn't check <laughs> fast enough and it will delay some of the published applications as far as the launch and, you know, reflect poorly on your user login time. But, um, a lot of that got rectified when we moved to a, a faster back end, like, uh, NVMe, um, uh, things like that. And, and is that something we we all see uh, is keeping the profiles of a published application or a virtual desktop separated, but then also the different profile types different too, right? So the things can still work between there. Yeah, at least that, at least that's still one of my recommendations to keep the the profile separate from the VDI yeah. and, the, and the center of environment. Um, actually, I, I, I think um, a few years back, I think it was um, it was harder to mix the operating system settings than it is today because hmm. the server operating system and Windows 10 or Windows 11 are so close together now. So um, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it mattered that much, but I, but I still recommend it just to to have the possibility of, of splitting out these profiles uh, also in case of um, uh, eye observation or um, uh, high availability scenarios or disaster recovery or stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's exactly the path that I would recommend as well. Um, in my situation, it's, it's more or less trying to retrain the, the end users and retrain the people that are used to using it this way and, and it just takes time. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we spoke a, a little about this before this, uh, before this event, right? Um, about this, uh, at least the uh, tendency I see is that uh, some people are, are still treating FS logics like some of the classic profile solutions. Either they try to exclude too much stuff uh, to save conserve storage space and they basically end up with the same kind of profile solution they were trying to get away from yeah well, yeah that's a good point where, where it doesn't really retain anything that's quote useful to the user you you just yeah. make yourself like a burden another file share to manage another set of group policies and the users aren't yeah. getting any benefits out of it 
Yeah, um, what I what I usually say today that FS Logix uh, at least has one cost and it's storage use. Because if you want to get the full benefit of, of the FS Logix container types, you have to um, you have to make it clear to yourself that that you will eventually consume more storage compared to Netflix profile management or compared to any mandatory profile solutions, when the a profile and stuff like that. And if you're not ready for that, maybe you should, you should reconsider going the FSLogix way. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a question in the chat about launching published apps from different delivery groups. And I know, Ray, you and I were talking about the um, the concurrent access and, and uh, published apps scenarios with FSLogix. And, and yeah. uh, we got deep into the weeds on, on session sharing and that kind of thing. But um, I, I mainly use FSLogix for published desktops. I know you use it for published apps. How do you handle it with uh, launching different published apps from different delivery groups? And, and do you end up with multiple containers or, or how do you solve for that? So that's a good question. Um, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> so I have scenarios where, um, and it's really, it, it's kind of a, in the beginning it was a bad architecture decision, uh, honestly by me. Um, because you know, I moved from Citrix uh, UPM like ASAP to FS Logics because you know the buzzword was like, hey, it's faster. Hey, you know, and it's not really true. So I, I rushed and implemented it. And when I implemented it, I didn't fully understand all the the, the backend components around that launching you know applications in different delivery groups. So we have a, a core banking application now um, that probably half of the, the financial system uses as a published app. So they're in one delivery group and they'll launch that published app. So it attaches the, the, the VHD, it sets the read write option. And then unfortunately everything after that is in a read only state because they're launching it at a different um, delivery group. So session sharing is not gonna kick in because it's not, it's not on the same server. So, and we looked at using, um, what was the word we were talking about, Mike, the other day, application groups and trying to do session sharing within application groups. Um, and then really it was just a time thing for, so for right now, what we do is um, I try to educate my users, which really it isn't, it isn't a good setup, but I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because <clears throat> a lot of the published applications they use is really just to get in there and do the job and there's no real data saving that they need to do. Like they don't go in there and, and um, have a certain application that's dependent on a location and app data or anything like that. It's very generic applications like, uh, you know, Office and Notepad++ and things of those nature. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucking out in that situation. So, um, what happens is when they launch their 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 first published application and it puts it in rewrite mode <clears throat> when they launch let's say uh word or excel you know word or excel is going to natively you know open and and that's when the uh profile type 3 kicks in in that scenario because they're launching on a different delivery controller um and the, they can save and and do all the things they need to do but let's say for example that um they don't save it and auto save is not on well they're gonna lose it yep, yep. so and like i said that's a that was a bad architectural decision because i rushed into it and you know i was like hey i've been wanting this for a long time and it's now it's free you know so yep, um yep. i got ahead of myself but looking back on it now um i would have i probably would have you know, if I could do the same thing now, which I can, I probably would have looked at taking the FS Logix piece and for published applications and maybe going away with it and using UPM. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I would tend to do as well. There's another question in the chat, um, and Patrick, you might be able to help with this one, around security and, and what you can do with the VHDX files in that you can't really scan them until they're mounted inside a VM. 
Yep. Um, so that means whatever AV solution you have during profile execution, file extraction, file copy paste into the profile, uh, that's when you have to catch the bad things. Otherwise, you would have to manually script something uh, using a couple different weird things to scan and mount all the VHDXs or VHDs to be able to see what's inside of them to do that. So that's where you've got to have AV uh, scanning while the user's in their profile, whether that's a published application VDA or if that's a desktop VDA, either one of them. Because otherwise, you're right. It is just kind of a magical profile solution that once things go in it, we don't know anything about it. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about it in a little bit would, would be how we're shrinking white space and backup and stuff like that. But when it comes to security, you've got to rely on your AV vendor to uh, look at that when it happens. Um, because just like anything, I mean, there can always be a file payload that's just hanging out, even if it's not getting executed. Yeah, I, I would say don't try to scan the contents of a VHDX while it's mounted by a user. You, you're going to have a bad time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, big time. I have heard of, of security or um, security software being able to scan the, the VHDX files while they are not loaded. Uh, I usually also do not recommend that because if it is scanning, if it is being scanned while not loaded and the user logs on, Oh, yeah. You basically have no idea whether it's, it's locked or not. Right. Um, yeah, because we don't, <clears throat> in many cases, you don't know when the user's coming. Right? No, exactly. So, yep. Now, All right. a lot of great questions here in the chat. Oh, I know. That's why I'm sitting here kind of <laughs> scrolling through. Oh, I yeah. see someone even wanting to go after FS Logix versus Profile Unity is another one. I, I actually want. just went through that. So, uh, <laughs> The Avante, I, I don't know have any knowledge about. Uh, I see it, I read it all the time, but we just looked at uh, Liquidware, you know, Flex Apps, Profile Unity, all that good stuff. And at the end of the day, it's still using the same technology as far as the container attachment. It's still a VHDX. Um, and personally, Profile Unity has what's called a, a profile rehydration. And what that is, is you can go from a Windows 10 operating system to a 2016 operating system to, uh, they say, Windows 11 now. And what it does, it rehydrates your profile and allows it to be compatible with that OS natively, fully, 100%. Um, that is one positive thing I do see about it. Um, now, you know, one of the things that we were being asked about is, hey, you know, if I'm using the... Flex apps, Liquidware, you know, product, even though it's called Profile Unity, it's not really, you don't really have to use the Profile Unity piece. You can still take advantage of all the bells and whistles that the app packaging and layering that other people may call it and still use FS Logics. You just don't enable that piece and it doesn't slow anything down. It, you don't see any delays. It's, it's still processing through uh, the configuration um, XML file that's put onto the sysvol. You know, it processes that for the application's uh, attachment, and then it still processes the FS logics behind the scenes. Now, I don't recommend running them both because obviously you're going to have a mix and match. Um, but as far as as far as that is concerned, it's 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 still a VHDX. It's still using the magic sauce that you know these these um, profile container solutions are using. So. You know, one's not really faster than the other one. It's really depend on environment and how you set things up, in my opinion, and based on what I'm, been, I've been doing for a while. Yeah, I, I would say that that is true. And and the the secret sauce with Profile Unity is is the fact that you can pick it up and move it between OS versions, and it'll it'll yeah. help you out. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And no, that and that is cool. Is, Avanti is, you know, a great solution, but it's it's complexity that it brings to the party. Oh is, boy! You know, right, like <laughs> um, it, it it can make some. That's a a couple of deployments that I've done with Avanti. The goal was to have sub ten second log on times, and after baking and putting all the group policies in there 
getting to, you know, at that time, just SSD storage for profiles and the SQL server and everything else, we were able to achieve it with that. Whereas at that time, UPM, we could not get anywhere close uh, with that because we were still, even if we baked in the group policy settings locally, uh, it just took it that long. So it was like all about speed. But then what usually people find out is like with Avanti, it's just, it's a lot of maintenance. You got to keep up with it. You know, you've got to patch it, give it hugs and kisses on a regular basis. Um, but it has a lot of powerful settings, especially security. As a security nerd, I love it. Um, but I don't think it's for the faint of heart, right? Um, it it and then, really isn't. If you can't wrap your head around uh, consolidating in your brain four different consoles at the same time to set up <laughs> permissions and user group rights and all of that stuff for a single VHDX container, then Avanti is not for you. It's yep. certainly not for me. I will put it that way. Yep. No, no. And I mean, I've, I've seen it, I've seen it do good things and I've seen it do bad things, but usually, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't maintain it, then that's when you're going to be causing yourself problems. If you have to hand it over to somebody who's never used Avanti, you're in for a world of pain. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that would be, I think we could say that about any, uh, even UEM solution too, right? From, because of how the settings are applied and the way the things are done with filters and policies, it becomes very complicated. So any profile or UEM based solution can add a lot of complexity, which is why I've always started to like FS logics was because in most cases it was vastly simpler to deploy, but to raise point, you can still make some, some mistakes in deploying that will hurt you and you have to circle back the wagon again, right? And then depending on if everything is one type, publish applications only or virtual desktops only, but if you've got that cross-pollination with that double hop, it's special considerations have to be done to do that. And yeah, there's yeah. different operating systems, you know? Now we'll give the, give we'll say one thing, um, and this could be that I was limited on time. We did... When I used Profile Unity, I used the profile hydration part, which was, you know, not the actual profile container, but it was allowing me to basically hydrate the settings that's, you know, in the H key current user hive and some of the app data settings. But because um, what I noticed is, you know, I had about a 10 second delay added because of all it was trying to pull that information uh -huh. um, and. You know, and I work with Adam Rue at Liquidware and, he, you know, he's very helpful and, you know, he. he he didn't say, hey, you know, this is an issue by using FS logic. They didn't say anything like that. It was really about tuning in and figuring out what I need and what I didn't. But moving forward, I knew that I'm going to be separating out the environments. You're going to use Zen desktop or, or virtual desktops and you're going to use published apps. And that's really how it was at the that I'm trying to go down at the time. So I was like, well, I really don't need to use the the profile rehydration at this time. And I kind of just put it behind me and move forward with FS logics. But that's just a consideration. If anybody ever decides to use the, the profile hydration part with the FS logic profiles that, you know, just remember that it may, you have to tweak it a little bit and figure out what your, your special tuning piece is. Right. And I think that's one thing that everyone forgets with any like profile solution too, is your mileage is always going to vary, right? It's not one size fits all. Um, you can look at the best practice settings from so many people, apply them, and you may have longer or slower login times. You may have faster, you may be the same. And then again, it might not work at all too, right? Um, yeah. you know, I think the biggest thing that I see on FS logics, uh, profile and even UPM is just file permissions. That's usually what gets people the most because it can't create it, right? Or can't get yeah. the exclusive lock. So when you talk about profiles, I think the next most important thing is how you deal with Microsoft Office, right? Um, because it's the uh, 400 pound gorilla that's sitting right beside your virtual desktop, you know, pounding on the cage, wanting to get out. And it has its, you know, autocomplete and uh, it's a custom spelling directory, directory and all that. So big, important settings that we've got to care about. So what, what's our thoughts on Office? Office? Well, this one's kind of a, a more of a, I guess, how you want to use it scenario. So I know I was talking with Mike and, you know, he, he was like, he liked to put it in the profile. And that's, you know, I've never thought about that. I was like, hey, that's actually a pretty good idea. But then in my use case, um, I've noticed that it goes back to the profile types again that I'm seeing that 
you know, when you have, let's say you have your profile solution set to three, for example, and a user is using a published app, and for whatever reason, it's an Office product, I've noticed that if they go to launch another instance over here that's Office related, I had to set the difference, um, the, the different session ID disk to like two or three to allow multiple VHDs to be created. And, you know, that was kind of a the hard one for me to really wrap my head around. I don't really know if Casper or if the other guys ran into that. It, it you know, so I had to go read a lot of, do a lot of reading on it. And um, from, what I, from what I read, it's like, you know, when you have basically one or two sessions opened up that different resources that play a part in the profile, if I didn't have that set, they would get a black screen for 60 seconds at three retries. And you can look in the event log. And you would see it retrying and it would retry and it's retrying. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But yeah, so yeah. when I when I set that to two, it allowed it to create another virtual or a read write disk under the office container. But it was weird because it wasn't always for like it, it, it seemed like for me it was for any published apps that I used. It wasn't just office. And um, yeah, it does. And it will. It will consume more storage, you know, and and. Um, and I don't know, you know, what you guys experiences with that. Um, so I, I used to split them out and then I changed my mind. Um, and so I put everything into the same container now. Uh, it just sort of simplifies things, um, makes things a bit quicker, I feel. Yeah. Um, there are arguments for splitting it out in that sometimes your OSTs become corrupt. But I think if you're running into OST corruption, you've, you've got other issues that you need to solve and, and splitting it out is just a temporary fix, really. Um, once you've got all this architected to the point where you, like all your permissions are fine, you're not running into these retry issues, um, you can get to a point where you, you run the whole thing for a year. You don't need to reboot the service. <laughs> like you've got 500 people on one box and, and you don't see a single OST corruption. Um, so I, I think like th there is a worry around OST corruption, but I think it's it's blown out of proportion into uh, compared to how often it will actually occur in your environment once you have everything set up correctly. Yeah, and you know it's funny because I, you know, I, I I follow James King a lot when it comes to the whole profile solution. Like I I, I read his blogs as if it's like a bible. Like I'm constantly reading it. And um, when I first implemented that that when I first had that issue, I read that um, that exactly what he did. He set the concurrent session based disk. Um, to two or three and he literally had the same issue it happened he was able to open up two different sessions two sessions from two different zen app servers and then you know when i didn't have that set like i said in the event log you could see it you could see the the fs logic event log trying to attach it and it couldn't um but again yeah, well, that's that's if you have it just depends on your setup I, I, one, one thing I like to do is is tweak those those retry timeout intervals because by default they're huge and it's true. You'll have someone sit there for for five to fifteen minutes, like not knowing what's going on, and then they're calling help desk. If you take those retry intervals like way down into the seconds instead of minutes, then they'll get an error message pop up within 10, 15 seconds instead of waiting ten minutes. Um, it saves a lot of headache with jobs. No, that's training. a good point. That is a good point. Yeah, that did that. There is an option in for that where you can trim that down too. Yeah, like if you've got fast storage, there's no there's no need to have those retry intervals so high. That yeah, yeah. You, you end up to your point just wasting the user's time, which wastes your time because then it's so long to recreate the problem, right? Because now you're waiting for this massive timeout and you're just watching event logs hoping for the best. So there's a few questions in the chat about um, replications and backup sets and that kind of stuff. How how are you guys handling that? So I'm using um, I can't pronounce it, but um, uh, B V cup B I don't know how you pronounce the word. It's B V C K. I, I have no idea. B B V cup two <laughs> backup two. Like, like I've never heard it said. I've only ever seen it typed. Yeah, I'm using that um, right now, and it's solid. Like it it will literally. 
um, it's an agent that you install on, let's say you have a Windows profile server and it's just one area, one profile server in your primary and a second profile server in your DR, wherever that's at. The agent is actually replicating the VHD in real time, tracking all the user changes. So it creates the virtual hard disk, uh, the VHDX over here with the profile and everything. And then what it does is there's another option in there that it tracks the user's changes and it will create like a, another folder and it puts the changes in that folder. And then once they log out, it takes those changes and puts them back into the VHDX. And yes, and the next question is, well, that's more storage. Yes, it is. You're right, it is more storage, but I chose I chose FS Logic, so I knew that storage consumption wasn't an issue for me. Well, I mean, and and that's the price to pay when you want high availability with multiple data centers, right? Like there's not, you, you have to have, quote, double the space for that. And then maybe a little smidge on top for, you know, everything to get moved around before it gets committed back and then deleted down too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's either that or you throw someone into a new environment with none of their settings and hope for the best. Yep. I mean, that, that, was, yeah. that was probably the past, you know, 10, 10 years and some change as a lot of deployments we did was like, oh, if they go to DR, they don't have their settings. Who cares? Right. right. They'll figure it out. There's bigger problems. Um, Although now, with, with OneDrive, you, you end up with a lot of your data back. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I, I have a hard time accepting that when you know they go to DR, well, they'll just they'll just figure it out. I don't know that that's to me that's not a good user experience. They, no, I need no. to give them the native. I need to give them, you know, as close as I can to 100 percent that they are that they have now in a production into a, a disaster recovery or an ac active site. Yep, um, yep. And I haven't experimented with this, but um, where you can you know if you're not using cloud cache where you can actually set another path inside the, where the VHD access is by like a semicolon. So you can say, hey, you know, you got file server 01 right here, comma file server 02. Now that doesn't mean that they're replicating. That just means that if this primary one's offline, it'll go to the next one. It'll go to the next one. And I know there was a lot of talk about that. They came out, FSL just came out and there was a blog that said, hey, this is not what it's used for. And James Rankin headed that up and figured all that out. and. Yep. Um, but that's another thing that I'm looking to do is to inside the path, put two locations and with um, the VBCK up to back up to whatever it, it, I can't pronounce the word, but let's, let's call it back up to yeah. So with that, if you have that set and you're replicating to the secondary, then you, you'll have I think you're going to have a very good native failover. Then the next question is, well, how do you replicate back? Well, you just kind of reverse it. You're really doing the same thing and you got to work your timing out. And it, it's not like I'm saying, it's not like going there and configuring it and setting it and you're done. You're going to have to tweak it and figure out what's your ideal uh, solution. So the whole idea is if your primary is offline, they're working over here now where you need to take, you're going to need to eventually replicate this back. So let's say your primary comes back online and they decide to log back in over here. Well, if they have data difference over here and over here, obviously they're not going to sync. So that's where you just create the secondary rule, replicate the VHD back, and it's going to overwrite that and have their changes from here. But then you get into a scenario where um, what if they overwrite something they redid? And that's, that's, that's really you got you to get in consideration and look at it and figure out what's the best solution. Yeah, so yeah. have you, there's uh, some questions in the chat around cloud cache, and I think that ties in well with the whole backup and DR. Have, have you guys used it? The The last time I used it, I ran into issues, and it's, it's thrown me off, so I haven't tried again. So I, I used it in the very beginning, and um, I was getting a lot of index issues, Windows search issues, and then um, I noticed that when one of my file servers went offline, everything was queued up on my VDA. Like it was just the ZenApp server had all the stuff queued up for the, the data. And then when the file server came back online, it's almost like it opened the floodgates and it just was a bad performance um, situation in my case. Um, but I haven't used it since right they kind of thing, right? Yeah, I haven't used it since then, though, but I know they made some improvements on it. Um, and a lot of people use it and they, they rave about it. 
I have, I have, uh, I think one customer, maybe two here in Denmark, uh, and and at least that one customer were experiencing uh, random file locks, where FS Logics concluded that the profile was locked when it wasn't locked, uh, at one of the cloud cache storage uh, locations. So at random points uh, during log on or log off, uh, cloud cache would determine that that the container were, was locked, that was fixed in 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 a another release at some point. So I actually think today they are still running, still using cloud cache on multiple, both on-prem and and cloud locations at the same time, because they have a hybrid in a, a hybrid setup. Uh, so there are people out there using cloud cache. I know. But that's also double the space I like oh, yeah. talked before. So, yeah, no, it's true. And then when we talk about space, one of the biggest things that I know <laughs> that I was waiting on was like, how do you shrink this stuff down? Because yeah. some of these people's profiles get just as wild <laughs> on a Citrix session and a VDA as oh, they yeah. on some random person's local computer where it gets to the gigabytes per user. And I always ask the question, what are you doing? You know, because that that's the very hard part to understand. Like if you were yeah, running, running teams, teams is normally the answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we can always bring in our, all of uh, all of us probably uh, are having a favorite application in Teams um, that yeah. can really really fill some data in 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 the container, and oh, yeah. uh, as soon as it's it's creating this data, it's it's deleting it uh, almost instantaneously. So uh, you'll end up with a container. At 10 gigabytes with two gigabytes worth of uh, worth of data, uh, so that uh, that has been uh, some fun times with file servers uh, being um, showing zero gigabytes of available space. Yeah, that's that's not fun. What, what yeah. I will say is, that if you're doing a new deployment, d deploy to ReFS rather than NTFS, and turn on yeah. DJU, and and you'll see like a lot of the white space issues kind of disappear um i i would also talk about uh jim moyle's um yeah. shrink scripts that's the one that i use i tend to run it as a scheduled task Same. it also has options to delete like profiles older than a certain number of days so yes. in in my old environment we were running it every weekend um, it would go through and, and delete profiles older than 90 days for profiles that weren't in use. It would go in and it would shrink them. Um, the advantage there is that I think he's tweaked it so that it reclaims a bit more white space by doing like a, a defrag inside the disk or, or doing something to try and reclaim and shuffle around those sectors so that you get a, a bigger contiguous block of white space that you can then reclaim. Um, yeah. I, I found it to be pretty good. Some of the other ones don't do that and you won't be able to shrink it quite as well um the other thing i like about jim's is he tweaked it to be able to run in parallel so uh it doesn't take as long to run against a huge data set right it's not just doing um, one at a time at a time at a time right and finishing one so it's only getting 100 users done in a night yeah i mean, I, I used to use the one by david Ott just because it had a gui and it was easier to run um yeah. and it, it yeah. works well um, but I think David and Jim have now worked together to uh, advance Jim scripts. So that, that would be the one that I'd recommend. Oh, that's good to know because I use David's now and I use Jim's. You know, I'm still testing with Jim's, but I use David's now. And there's a command line argument, but it's not as, as advanced as Jim's. And that's good to know that they're putting more into his script. I, I think they're at feature parity now. I mean, I might be wrong, but I know that Jim and David were talking like a while ago. So it would... Like I, I would think that they're they're about the same now. I know Liquidware has one. They have a VHD VHDX compacting utility as well. That uh, I haven't tried that one yet. I can't really I speak to that. I, I haven't tried it either. But it, it's another one of those um, you know those fabulous tools that we have. That you know, I know Casper has one. There's a lot of them out there, um, and I have tried almost all of them. And I wouldn't say that e there's a better one than the other one, but the thing I like about gems is, yeah, you can run it in parallel and I can set the threads high and I can just crank it, um, you know, late at night. And obviously the profile server's doing its job. It's, it's suffering, but at that time, depending on your environment, they're not being used, but right. Yeah. It yeah. just depends. Oh. 
I'll, I'll say that, that your model script is definitely better than mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about deduplication? Oh, the so, that, so that's a big one for me. So yeah. I was shrinking like every couple of days and um, I just was being greedy with storage, even though I don't have to really worry about storage. I just was I'm one of those old school guys that, you know, I want to clean up every little piece of information I can before I go expand a line or a data store. So, um, you know, I hit up Slack and was just doing some chatting about it. And the guy's like, hey, look at deduplication. I'm like, oh, man, I didn't even think about that. You know, we use it in our file server. So I went to my dev server and I used uh, Backup 2 to replicate my entire four terabytes to a DR environment. And it took about, you know, maybe four hours or so. I went in there and I basically turned on dedupe and it set the settings. And um, in the end of the day, I think I got back like 1.6 terabytes wow. of savings. <laughs> yeah. And I went through, you know, there, and inside of the, the the Windows dedupe settings, you got like file server, VDI, you know, different pieces. And I tried two of them and the savings were the same. Um, so I just stuck with the native file server type. Yeah. And to this day, like, for example, if I something happens and my shrink scripts don't run, for example, and my, my user profiles aren't, you know, in the in the high of hitting that 30 gig base limit that probably a lot of people don't know exists that exist. Um, I don't have to run my shrink scripts to to shrink the profile because of the disk, the deduplication you know, hits my disk and I'm good. Um, but that that statement can be can be heard different. And the reason I don't the reason I said that is because my users aren't putting 20, 25 gigs in their profile. My profile is anywhere between five to 15 gigs. So if I miss a shrink, you know, I'm okay. That doesn't mean deduplication is going to shrink their profile. That's not what I'm saying. Deduplication is going to help with the overall disk space. <clears throat> disk space and, and all that is, is going to be a consistent battle forever, I think. Uh, Jared had a good question here. Uh, Mike tried to answer a little bit of it there, but Ray, you might have it. And Casper too, is they had issues with ReFS uh, when they had a thousand users on server 2019, when they had scalability issues. Oh, 2019. That's like the devil of Microsoft. I mean, it's not um, bad as like Vista, you know I mean? No, it's true. It's true. Um, I, I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't seen, those kind of issues with ReFS, but then again, I see Mike is Mike mentioned that that he's only had around 500 users per server. That's basically also the the same amount, maybe maybe a bit more uh, for a file server. Uh, so I don't know if if there is any kind of upper limit on maximum amount of users that a ReFS share can handle. I don't know. I haven't come across any information about that. I have run into issues with EPM and the maximum number of users. Um, I haven't run into issues with FS Logics uh, yet. Um, the UPM issues I ran into, we, we had something like 4,000 users trying to access a single file server and it ran out of ephemeral ports. So, um, wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a, so, someone decided to turn on Active Writeback Registry. And, yeah, I was just going to ask if, if Active Writeback was so bad. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I have, I'd never up until that point seen a server run out of ephemeral ports. So, um, that's, that's something to be said for that. But, uh, yeah, I, in terms of ReFS, um, at around the 500 user mark with users with like 30 gig profiles, um, this was running on Nutanix storage as a backend. Um, well, it wasn't Nutanix files. It was ReFS on server 2019. Um, wasn't doing anything special, but yeah, we were, we had about 500 concurrent users and, and it was fine. So maybe something happens above that number. I, I couldn't say, um, but I haven't seen anything around ReFS to indicate that there's a, there's an upper limit on the number of sort of streams that it can handle at the same time. Um, I mean, you will run into hardware limitations. Uh, and, and resource constraints, the more users that you try to throw at a single file server, and you might be better off trying to split that file server into two so that you, you're running two at 500 rather than one at 1,000. 
and that's that's funny. It's good you say that because actually there's a script out there. I saw um, James Rankin. He, he I think they're doing that now in one environment where they're they're taking a number of users and they're putting here. A number of users are putting there based on uh, PowerShell script that some uh, can't remember the guy that helped him build it, but it was pretty clever. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think I've I've seen some of that. The, um, putting all your eggs in the one basket kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Ryan Revord? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. That was I read it and I was like, wow, blown away. Yeah, that's some that's some interesting stuff. I haven't uh, ever had to do it for quite that many users, but uh, we'd definitely try it that way the next time I do. So I see a question, and I want to. Um, we kind of talked about it. Basically, what's your recommendation on um, splitting up the office container and profile container? And I think it depends on your environment and your use case. Um, so for like for me, um, being that I'm in where I'm at now, I split it um, because, well, let me think why I actually do it. I think because the multiple in app sessions, that's probably why. Um, but that's probably the only real reason I can think of off the top of my head is the multiple Zen app sessions where they, they would hit multiple servers and, uh, that, that is needed I'm, I'm for, in my use case. Yeah. I, I think it comes down to published applications versus published desktop. If you're doing published desktop, you really don't need to split. If you're doing a published app, like if you decide to publish Outlook and you don't want all of the other craft from the the um, profile container and you want that just the office stuff to be able to move around, then then yes, split them out. Um, I I tend to focus more on on published desktops, so or, or like dedicated desktops. Um, so in that scenario, I, I don't see a point in splitting them. Just just keep them all in the same container. But yeah, for published apps, it, it can definitely make sense to to split it out. Yeah, I, I usually talk uh, about what kind of uh, data that's going into the container. If if my customer has a huge amount of Office 365 based data, OST files, uh, SharePoint Online, uh, OneDrive, uh, there could be a, a backup issue. If you if you insist on backing up your profile container, it could be uh, it could be a valid point that splitting out these data types in 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 separate containers uh, because. Does it really make sense to back up your OST file or your OneDrive container? Yeah, that's true. It, that, it that's usually true. doesn't because it's cached information. Yes, you will probably take a CPU resource hit whenever uh, or if the user is going to resync their cached information. But again, you really need to weigh out the, the pros and cons in this. Um, I, I tend to go with your point of view, Mike. Um, try to keep it simple going with one container un until we can't go with one container anymore. I just thought of something with the, the ReFS question. Um, when I was doing it with ReFS, I was mounting the VHDX files using the machine account rather than the user mm. account. Um, mm. you, you might want to try doing that and seeing if things improve. Um, I tend to run into a lot of issues mounting the VHDX files as user accounts just because of different environments and their password change policies. Um, if you have a yeah. password change that gets initiated during the middle of a, an FS logic session, you can you can end up locking a disk. Um, and you really don't want to end up in that situation. Uh, and again, it kind of depends on your environment. But if you have people that keep sessions open for a week at a time and they only get kicked off when machine reboot on the weekend, you can easily run into a situation where their password will change midweek and it will completely lock the disk. Um, and that's that's a bit of a nightmare for support people to go and, and sort out. Um, if so what do you do? You just it, Instead of using the exclude, include and exclude groups that have users, you use it for machine groups? There's there's a setting in the, in the GPOs where you essentially say mount the VHD under the machine account rather than the individual ah. user account. And it'll use the local machine account to go and mount the VHDX. So Interesting. the user the account accounts permissions, overall. like if the password changes or whatever, it, it doesn't stop them from mounting the file. That's yeah. cool. I, I didn't realize. I, mean, I know you said that, but I never knew that that setting existed. Yeah. I mean, I, I find that most people just leave it as the default. But um, 
especially if you're in environments where you have forced password changes and that's a whole other conversation that, that Patrick and I have had before, but we won't get into here. Stop forcing your users to change their password and you won't run oh, into that problem. Um, oh, but also, well, no, 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 no. the machine account, you won't run into the problem either. I guess we're running out of time. Um, we got T minus one minute. We're about to turn into pumpkins as we get ready for control up here. So we got a we got a, a round table, um, two fifty five Pacific time. Is that what PT means? So yep, yep. there's some more stuff on our list we wanted to talk about. Some things I added that may not be important, but um, just to kind of just hash it out and talk and I don't know, give advice and get advice and. Well, yeah, because well, we know so much of this is it depends is is really kind of hearing it because everyone has had so many different experiences. Uh, and, I, and, and I like the I know that that was possible, Mike, but I'd forgot about that. You know, I'm the one causing the problem with password resets, you know. So there's a there is one blog I want to send everybody that did. And it's not me. It's from, uh, again, my my FS logics and UPM Bible. Um, I'll put it hopefully. Um, I put it in the chat, but maybe some Stephanie or Jennifer can give it to everybody. Um, you know, everybody's like, which is better? Well, this explains a lot of it. This is going to yeah, give yeah. you a, this is going to give you a an eye opener on all the features and, and situations. All right. Anyways. John, are you ready for some control up party stuff here? Or is Josh is in seeing it? You're, you're cutting it over. Yeah, no, thank you. Ray, Mike, Casper, Patrick does. That stuff's always really good to talk about. I think it's people struggle with it and there's always so much information. Um, yeah, just like they said, make sure you check out their round table. Um, keep uh, and yeah, next up we have control up. A user has an issue. Control Up can get a screenshot of the user session to give you visibility. This user is having issues and I'd like to troubleshoot in their session using their rights. We can start a command prompt to troubleshoot further. Security restrictions prevent us from starting the command prompt. Instead of messing with group policy objects, we can remove the session's group policy settings and now we can start a command prompt to continue troubleshooting. The prompt is now available to walk the user through some troubleshooting steps. Once complete, we can reapply group policy with control up. We have a Citrix user who put in a ticket having poor user experience. There are multiple sessions. We can start a chat with specific sessions to ensure this is the correct one. The high level session metrics look good. Let's drill into the session and see the session processes. Sorting by CPU, we don't see anything on the Citrix side that it's causing experience degradation. Most troubleshooting tools would stop here, but not control up. The end user is on an iGel device being monitored by control up. Control up has full visibility into iGel devices. We'll tell control up to navigate to the device in the console. Immediately, we can see the iGel device has high CPU utilization. However, the processes view in control up highlight the root cause. WebKit web process is consuming significant resources. This process started after a recent change to turn on browser content redirection. Knowing the root cause, the admins can now work on fixing this problem. Control up is an excellent tool for managing your infrastructure. For example, if you select a group of infrastructure machines, you can live audit and baseline your Windows update patches. By selecting Manage Programs and Updates and expanding Updates, then expanding Microsoft Windows, ControlUp shows you all the patches applied and any differences between the machines in a color-coded display. Metadata on the compared machines is available by clicking on a patch. To save the report on your current patch state, click Export in the upper left. ControlUp's controller engine makes it a snap to see inconsistencies in your infrastructure. But ControlUp doesn't stop there. By expanding the ControlUp console with script actions, we can list all available or approved Windows updates. In addition, the script action can also apply updates. ControlUp's grouping engine takes the output of the available Windows updates, 
and shows you which machines require different patches. By clicking export on the control up script actions result window, you can now have a complete report of patches applied and patches available. Access solve from within control up by clicking on the solve tab and then clicking on the solve button. This will launch control up solve, a web-based version of the control up real-time console. The landing page is a high level dashboard view. Perfect for any administrator, any administrator help desk, help desk or, knock. or knock. There are three, there are three dashboards, dashboards available. available. One showing one user experience user metrics, metrics, one showing resource consumption, consumption, and one showing and all combined all metrics. metrics. Switching to switching discovery to view, discovery and we have drilled we have into drilled our environment into our for, environment the, first for the first time. The discovery view has a new dynamic, dynamic topology, topology bar, bar showing your environment your as environment clickable, clickable logical resources. resources. Underneath, underneath is a graph, is a graph view graph showing the aggregate, aggregate of the metrics. The metrics. And, lastly, and lastly, underneath is the real-time grid view. The classic control up tree is available by clicking the open tree button. Just like the console today, you can click on a folder to focus the main display on those objects. Columns have been given new capabilities. Filters can be applied on a per column basis. Here, we'll show only machines with more than 50% memory utilization. There is also a search box with free text queries. The display of the grid can be customized. The grid can be expanded to show more items by hiding the aggregate graphs. Expand it further to grid only view, maximizing viewing of the number of simultaneous objects. Columns can be added, removed, rearranged, and the grid density can be selected between default, comfortable, and compact. Now, the real-time view is great, but what if you want to glance at what happened yesterday? Within Solve, we tie into control up insights, and we can pull recent historical data. Recent historical data goes back up to three days. Metrics with an expand option will show you some additional metrics for a quick historical glance. In this view, historical data can be shown for up to one month ago. Try Control Up for free at www.controlup.com. Be sure to check out their booth. Again, you can ask questions, um, answer their um, poll questions, and uh, another opportunity to win prizes. Uh, next is EG Innovations. Good afternoon. My name is John Worthington. I'm the Director of Customer Success at EG Innovations, and I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to tell you about our company. From the early days of physical machines to virtualized infrastructures, public cloud services, and today's modern digital services, EG Innovations has been helping customers answer the question, why is my application slow? With the digital experience being key to a competitive edge, the digital workspace, whether that's located on your premises in a public cloud such as Azure or AWS, or whether it's a hybrid like Citrix Cloud, customers need a 360 degree view of user experience, and that's what EG Innovations provides. But since Citrix users voted this video a winner in the recent Citrix Ready Spotlight contest, I'm going to let that do the talking and then provide a few concluding remarks. Citrix is redesigning the way how the future works. With Citrix Digital Workspace, we believe work is no longer a place. It's an increasingly dynamic activity. That's why the digital workspaces from Citrix are adaptable, offering employees freedom and security. Where the work happens on site, on the road, or in the cloud, Citrix gives you confidence without compromise. However, sometimes things go wrong. When a user complains of sluggish performance, it becomes challenging for a Citrix administrator to identify the source of the problem. EG Enterprise is a purpose-built monitoring and analytics solution for Citrix environments that allows administration teams to proactively monitor and troubleshoot performance issues instantly, even before users notice thereby ensuring a superior digital workspace experience. Let's look at the four key areas where EG Enterprise helps Citrix customers. The performance of a Citrix digital workspace is determined by the experience it delivers to users. EG Enterprise measures all aspects of Citrix user experience. Log on and desktop launch times are measured by synthetic simulation. In addition, EG Enterprise monitors the real user experience by tracking every single Citrix session, providing several insights. 
When user experience is poor, what is causing this is the next question. To answer this, end-to-end -end visibility is essential. EG Enterprise has built-in expertise to monitor the performance of every Citrix workspace tier. And EG Enterprise monitors all the IT infrastructure services supporting Citrix. You can collect thousands of metrics, but where is the root cause? To determine this, EG Enterprise auto-constructs a service topology map, highlighting the dependencies between the different Citrix tiers and the supporting infrastructure. Performance metrics across all tiers are auto-correlated in real time, and the root cause of the problem is highlighted clearly. The value of a monitoring tool goes beyond problem diagnosis and troubleshooting. Trends of metrics collected can be analyzed across tiers and insights obtained for optimizing and right-sizing your infrastructure so you can accommodate more users. If you want to make your daily routine more productive, you must move from reactive to proactive monitoring. EG Enterprise is a Citrix-ready verified solution that can help you achieve your Citrix user experience and ROI goals. Now, besides thanking all of you who voted for our video, I'd like to make a few final comments. The deep domain expertise EG Enterprise has in all components in the Citrix stack, including Citrix Cloud, may be one reason why Citrix has uh, selected EG Enterprise as the exclusive performance monitor for their major trade shows and more recently for their global demonstration center. But the mission critical nature of the digital workspace and our ability to provide total performance visibility into both Citrix and non-Citrix tiers of the digital workspace are also important drivers. A Forrester study found that almost all user experience problems relied on several parts of the IT infrastructure. We've independently verified that customers get rapid ROI on their investment in EG Enterprise, as well as significant improvements in their ability to proactively isolate performance issues. Customers can no longer afford to treat the digital workspace as just another technical silo. There's just too many moving parts to today's digital workspaces. The total performance visibility that EG Enterprise provides can enable a new kind of IT hero, someone that embraces transparency and moves your organization to proactive performance management. If you'd like to hear more, stop by our booth and enter our drawing for a Bose wireless earbud giveaway, and we'll give you a gift certificate as our way of saying thank you. Um, again, yeah, please be sure to check out uh, EG's booth for more information to engage, engage with their staff and to answer their poll question for the uh, drawing. Next, um, he doesn't need an in introduction, but just in case, I'm gonna introduce him, Pat Patterson. He's the leading developer and, 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 Vangel and I cannot say this word, Angel and Vangelicist <laughs> at Citrix. Um, he will be telling us about micro apps at Citrix Converge. Uh, and we encourage you to ask questions in the chat. Okay, thanks, Josh. Can you hear me? I guess you can, or you would have told me by now. Hi, I'm Pat Patterson. I'm the Director of Developer Evangelism at Citrix, and um, I was asked to uh, give an update on micro apps, uh, always a popular topic. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to walk you through the micro apps content at our Converge conference two weeks ago. And then I'm going to show you the latest micro app feature, which is called user providers. And I'll explain what that is down the line. So I, you will be pleased to know I have exactly one slide and its uh, resources, and I will show it to you at the end. So let's go to Safari and um, talk about what happened at Converge. So if you've been around um, micro apps for a while and the, uh, the world of Citrix, let me just maximize this. Oh, I will need to obviously share my screen. Don't, and I will leave a hostage to fortune by sharing my entire screen. All right, so hopefully you can see my uh, browser there. Citrix Converge 2021 took place, um, let's see, uh, two weeks ago now. And um, 
If you've been around micro apps for a while, you will know that originally Converge was expressly focused on micro apps. It's grown since then, so it now encompasses all of Citrix's uh, products and services. So virtual apps and desktops, app delivery security, um, you name it, it's all at Converge. Now, focusing on micro apps in particular, um, there were a lot of really, really uh, interesting sessions. I'm going to pick out what I think are the key sessions. Now, on the Monday of uh, Converge, uh, two of our product managers ran a hands-on workshop. So you can see there, build the future of work with Podio and micro apps. Now, I should mention every session at Converge was recorded. So this is why I'm kind of giving you this uh, uh, roadmap of how to find them. And I will give you the URL uh, you can use to register for Converge. You can still get to all of these recordings until the end of November. So uh, Sumedha uh, Panwa and Tra Chandrika Srinivasan um, gave an introduction or presented a workshop, rather, explaining how to use Podio as the system of record for your micro apps. So um, it's a great session. I think it's about, uh, yeah, it's about an hour and a half long. And they really walk through step-by-step uh, step using um, the access, so using the uh, micro apps test instance and a free Podio sign up. So you can literally take an hour and a half and follow that through uh, whenever you want to, to learn how to use Podio as your system of record. Now, going back to the uh, agenda, so if we click through, um, Converge had three uh, tracks, and they're represented over here on the left as topics. So we can pick out the micro app sessions. They're in the work solutions uh, track. So you can see there that uh, on Monday, there was that uh, workshop there. Uh, I'm going to go to Tuesday. And this is where um, we get down to Phil Whiffen's session on building on top of CVAD service micro apps. Now, Phil is a, let me just fast forward to, Gracious there stories. he is. So Phil is a technical marketing manager uh, here at Citrix. He is responsible for uh, TechZone. And he did one of the early integrations with micro apps to integrate with the CVAD REST API. So in this session, um, I think it's about, it should be at, yeah, about 25 minutes. He explains how to how that works and then uh, building various different technologies. So things like giving users the ability to um, reset their sessions, giving them self-service into, uh, into CVAD, to be able to log themselves out, reset their session, all of that kind of thing. So uh, Phil uh, Phil's work is actually now part of um, a standard Citrix micro app. Uh, so it's really great to get that insight there. Uh, navigating back, and of course, somebody has started a leaf blower outside my home office. Obviously, that was always going to happen. So um, scrolling down, um, Brandon Bellman and Bob, D Bob Dankert uh, from our partner in Vision I IT uh, presented a session uh, explaining how to use uh, middleware to, uh, let me just see, uh, let's get a picture of them. Oh, there they are. How to use middleware with micro apps. So, you know, if we go back to, uh, you know, the core use case of micro apps is that they can um, make calls to an API. So that is often a SaaS API. So it could be ServiceNow or Salesforce um, and expose some slice of functionality to the end user. So um, in uh, ServiceNow, it might be, uh, I want to create a trouble ticket. Uh, 
Now, uh, and the point of this is so that you can provide this micro app within um, Citrix workspace so that uh, users can easily access frequently used functionality without having to go over to ServiceNow and dig down through uh, some hierarchy of pages there. Now, this works really, really well when your system of record has a RESTful API. And uh, many of them do. So Salesforce, ServiceNow, uh, Conquer have very easy to use. Oh my goodness, it's in stereo now. I've got two leaf blowers. So I hope my mic is uh, picking up more of me than them. But uh, anyway, uh, moving on. So uh, the point of this is that when your system of record does not have a nice RESTful API, um, you might need some middleware. And this is exactly what uh, Brandon and Bob described. Some middleware that can plug into um, a, maybe a non-RESTful API, uh, maybe some legacy technology, and expose um, functionality as a RESTful API that you can plug a micro app right into. So great stuff there from our partners at Envision IT. And I will answer questions at the end. Um, and it's a, kind of a bit tricky to flip from full screen to the, uh, the chat. Um, and we'll have an opportunity later on in that roundtable session. So one of our sponsors, our goal, one of our gold sponsors at, uh, at uh, Converge, uh, Brickbridge Consulting, and they presented a really interesting session. Uh, let me see if I, there we go. There's Gil. So Gil Roberts at uh, BrickBridge presented a really interesting session on human-centered workflow design. So this is a little uh, higher level. This isn't kind of the nuts and bolts of um, micro apps, but BrickBridge have been very successful with micro app technology in the marketplace. And here Gil is giving you the way that they think about designing that micro app experience centering uh, the, the design around people and the workflows that they want to uh, use in their, uh, in, their daily, uh, in their daily work. And then uh, at the end of Tuesday, we had a really, really good session from uh, Marcin Simon and um, Chris Strauss. Let's, uh, let's, there we go. Oh. So Marcin's got his eyes closed. There we go. That's better. So uh, Marcin and uh, Chris um, have worked on micro apps at Citrix. So we often talk about, about ourselves at Citrix as customer zero. And um, we have uh, deployed micro apps, um, many micro apps for many different functions. So if I want to request some uh, paid time off, I go into Workspace and there is a request PTO action. And I just click that and I get a form and I fill in the date and um, uh, maybe a message to my manager saying, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm planning to use a PTO for. I don't know, that seems a bit superfluous. It's basically the dates that you want to take off. Um, and I can just submit that right from Citrix Workspace, as well as uh, filing expenses, um, opening uh, tickets, trouble tickets, and a whole host of other functionality. So I'm not flipping from tab to tab to tab across different SaaS applications. So anyway, so um, Martin and Chris give a really good uh, run through of exactly uh, how we've done that at Citrix and some of the benefits that we've seen from it. So that was Tuesday. And moving on to Wednesday, um, you might want to watch the uh, keynote for the Work Solutions track. So this was our uh, product manager, Jay Tomlin, giving you um, an overview of work solutions. So work solutions at Citrix is wider than just micro apps. This is where in Converge, we brought together uh, micro apps, Podio, Write Signature, 
ShareFile, all of those um, workplace technologies uh, into a coherent uh, set of sessions. So really worth tuning in for uh, Jay, uh, giving an overview there. And you know, you'll be relieved to know in common with uh, most of the sessions, uh, this is well, in fact, less than 25 minutes, 16 minutes. So Jay gives a really good overview in that uh, in that session as to where things fit together. So um, yeah, moving on down Wednesday, um, there's a really good session, a couple of a couple more really good micro app focus sessions. So um, one of the early micro apps was actually integrating with uh, Spotify. So that, uh, let's see, Charlie Brinson is describing it here. Oh, he's, let's, you can get a shot of Charlie with his dogs, it looks like. So in this session, um, Charlie is talking about this Spotify podcast micro app. So you can imagine that maybe you want to provide a podcast series to your end users. We actually have a number of podcast series that we put out at Citrix. So um, Remote Works, Tech Fusion, uh, the Clickdown, um, and we can give users access to those as new episodes are available within Citrix Workspace, again, with a micro app that allows them to access that podcast right within Citrix Workspace. So what we're doing there is kind of bridging that gap between their kind of work uh, environment and uh, the wider world of uh, media podcasts. So, you know, you, people can uh, drop into this podcast, maybe in their lunch hour, maybe take some time off in the afternoon and keep up to date with uh, what you as the, as the enterprise and the admin uh, think uh, is important to provide. Okay, so uh, there was there was a lot of really really cool uh, micro app content at uh, at Converge. This has to be one of the more inventive applications. So uh, in this session, uh, Chris Mathieu, um, who I believe was involved with OctoBlue back in the day. Um, is the founder of a startup called Group Room. And he uh, has built a, a virtual environment, Group Room, so that remote employees can kind of move around this environment and interact as if they were in a live space, uh, an in real life space. So um, again, uh, it won't surprise you to learn that uh, Chris built a micro app to uh, to work with Group Room and bring teams together. And I think this is a really interesting one for, you know, seeing the possibilities as, uh, you know, we get beyond uh, applications like, you know, filing for PTO and uh, trouble tickets. As, as core as they are to the work experience, um, you know that we've we've seen we've seen that work use case a few times. So uh, one more that I want to uh, really uh, share with you uh, for Wednesday is uh, Alex Zal, another uh, loyal Citrix partner at uh, A2K, who ah, he doesn't put himself on screen here. So he talks about one aspect of. Um, micro apps that is key to a responsive uh, experience for users. Now, the default way that micro apps work is that uh, they're a low code slash no code technology. You configure a micro app to uh, interact with a, an API and it can periodically synchronize data from that API into the micro app cache within your uh, Citrix workspace. Now, that works. But anytime you're doing that periodic synchronization, polling, 
there's a trade-off between um, hitting that API and the uh, currency of data. So if you're hitting that API, say, every minute, every five minutes, you may be using up resources. You may be incurring cost. At many service providers, API calls are a limited resource. So um, you don't want to be calling them every minute necessarily. But then the trade-off is when something changes in that system of record, how long do you want your users to have to wait to see that change? So. Um, Webhooks are a way of solving this problem, of taking this trade-off out of the picture. Webhooks allow uh, those systems of records that are able to make calls out to HTTP URLs when something changes to do exactly that. They provide an endpoint within your um, micro app service that you can configure so that the service provider, again, you configure the service provider, you tell it, hey, here's this URL that I want you to call whenever anything changes. And then uh, when uh, data is added, changed, removed from that uh, system of record, there's a call from the service provider to micro apps, uh, the micro app service, and it can react uh, in real time. So the, the upside is that you're only interacting with the service when you need to, and your users are getting up-to-date information all the time. So I've probably taken half the time to explain that, that uh, uh, the, as Alex spends in, um, in his uh, session. But this is really working through a, uh, a real-life application of this, and uh, you know they'll take you through uh, the details. I, it's one of my favorite aspects of, of micro apps because it, it really, really uh, allows you to build responsive integrations. I'll mention as we go through, one of the themes at uh, Converge this year was uh, DevOps. And we had a number of sessions around different aspects of DevOps. So we had a workshop from um, Kelim, let me just uh, remember his last name. Uh, sorry, Kerim Satili at HashiCorp. Uh, HashiCorp are the company that uh, created uh, Terraform and Packer. So certainly I know that Packer is pretty widely used in our community for building machine images. So if you want to get more hands-on, oh, here he is. There's Karim in his screen. If you want to get more hands-on with these kind of DevOps technologies, again, that recorded um, workshop is a really, really good way to do that. And we have a number of sessions, uh, you know, along the DevOps uh, theme. Oh, and if you are not careful, Karim will follow you around. Hang on. Stop, stop. All right, let's just do this. It's still there. Ah, there we go. Okay, apologies for that. Just uh, the platform. The platform does it best. It does its best to make sure you don't miss anything. So anyway, I am. Um, I was talking about work solutions. Yeah. So um, this is a kind of cross-cutting concern, DevOps. So it does appear, you know, on all of the tracks. So you'll see that when you select work solutions, you'll see these DevOps sessions. And this was a really, really interesting panel uh, that I was lucky enough to moderate uh, between uh, four people uh, active in the DevOps industry. OK, so uh, moving on to Thursday, the final day of, um, of uh, Citrix Converge. Now, here, I think we've gotten most of the specific micro apps uh, sessions. Yeah, my recollection is correct. There's one in, uh, well, I'd say a couple here that are really worth uh, dropping in for. So one is from uh, Chris Jukin, um, and I think he's Dutch, and I've probably uh, butchered his last name from Kono Senza, and uh, Chris Twist 
from Rawworks. So just like BrickBridge, Rawworks were a Converge gold sponsor and, you know, a repeat offender in the Converge hackathons. So in this session, um, the two Chris's go through how, uh, what it means, what this idea of low code and no code actually means. And they go beyond just uh, micro apps to talk about Microsoft Power Apps as well. So basically focusing in on, you know, just how you can create your own applications without having to write a whole bunch of code. Um, highly recommended. Um, uh, Rawworks in particular always uh, deliver great uh, content at, uh, at Converge. And then the very last session I want to point you to is uh, another Rawworks presenter. So Gerhon, I think it is, uh, another uh, an, another Nederlander, Dutchman, um, talking about um, micro apps at a Citrix customer. So one of the first uh micro app deployments was at a a municipality in the Netherlands called Holland's Kroon. Now um, they embraced micro apps to uh, within that uh, local authority, uh, local government. And this is a great summary of how they derived value from it. And they were, were very innovative. I mean, in fact, they actually won a Citrix Innovation Award. And uh, Geron was one of the uh, consultants at the center of that deployment. So this is a great example. You know, we, this is a, you know, not, we're not down in the nuts and bolts of micro apps here, but we're at the level of, okay, how are they actually benefiting real users? So the only other thing I would mention about uh, Converge is um, if you are on the uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktops uh, side of uh, technology, then definitely uh, drop in for the opening keynote, delivering the workspace anytime, any place, anywhere. And uh, in there, I join uh, Christian Riley and one of our CTPs, Lee Jeffries, to talk about um, a community lab uh, program that we are putting together. And we're actually recruiting um, participants for a public pilot of this community lab. Uh, this isn't the place to tell you more about it. You can jump into that uh, uh, opening keynote at Converge and find out all about that, but I will give you the URL at the end. Okay, so that was micro apps at uh, Converge. Several hours of key uh, sessions that you can get yourself up to date on demand. Uh, like I said, it'll be available within this platform until the end of November and then uh, after that, we will migrate the content over to YouTube. So it'll be uh, available indefinitely. Now, I'd like to reuse the remainder of my time to tell you about uh, this user provider feature that we recently uh, uh, added to, um, to micro apps. Now, you don't have to know a lot about uh, you know how my, micro apps work to appreciate what uh, is going to be going on here. I've got a micro app I cre created uh, earlier. You know this is an integration. I showed it at an Asia Pacific event here, and this particular one. Sorry, I should do uh, edit over there. So this particular integration, it's not uh, important particularly what it does. Uh, it happens to call into um, uh, Microsoft Azure using their Graph API, and it actually retrieves data from an Excel workbook. So specifically data 
uh, relating to uh, beer. So um, in that uh, in that webinar, I explained how to uh, how to use the um, micro app scripting functionality to to do this, but I'm just using it here as uh, just a micro app that that exists because what I want to focus on is how we make a micro app such as this create beer micro app. So an action to uh, create a beer record available to end users. Now, up until now, the way to do that has been to um, choose um, an Active Directory domain. And then you could do it through group membership or even down to uh, selecting individual users. And uh, let's see if I've got any groups there. Admins, no. Uh, but everything was tied to Active Directory. And, uh, you know, this works. I could, uh, you know, go over to my, in fact, let's do that now. So if I go over to, uh, I think I need to make this smaller and then go over to my other Safari window. So here's an incognito window. I'm logged into uh, Citrix Workspace as this particular user here. And you can see I've got no actions available, but I just added myself as a subscriber to this Create Beer micro app. And this works. If I refresh this, sometimes it takes a few seconds, but hopefully those seconds have now elapsed. Oh, no, no actions yet. Come on. Create beer. So, you know, we're in the business here of making these micro apps available to some relevant subset of users. And this works and we can control these, but everything is in Active Directory. And that's not always the appropriate place for it to be because we are integrating with um, external systems, SaaS providers, uh, APIs. And that, uh, you know, that decision of who gets to access this micro app um, may be better taken with uh, identity and group membership in um, another location. So, we introduced this concept of uh, user providers. So um, this is documented. You know, you can go into the product documentation here and read all about it. I'm actually going to show you how it works. Now, for the sake of argument, and since I worked there for five and a half years and I know the APIs, I'm going to take my... Uh, user and group data from Salesforce. So Salesforce has users. These are all the users that can log into my uh, uh, this Salesforce developer edition. And it has these public groups. Uh, it's got quite a complex group model. You know, there's, uh, there's also roles and uh, hierarchies and so on. I use public groups just to keep this very simple. And so I've got two groups, wizards and wombats. And if I look in my wizards group, uh, I've got myself. So what I'm actually going to do is take myself out of that group so that it is empty. So if I save that, then my group is empty. And I've got my user here, Pat Patterson. And just to make things simple for me, because this Salesforce environment already existed and I didn't want to go messing with usernames and emails. I've used the title field to hold that uh, email there, that uh, UPN. So this is really key. This is what ties this uh, Salesforce user to uh, the user logging into Citrix workspace. So, you know, in reality, uh, this data would be in the email or the username. But like I said, those weren't amenable to change. And I've got like this local uh, local domain going on here. So I cheated a little bit and just put it in title. Um, you wouldn't do this in the real world. But everything else here is, is pretty uh, works as, as it would. OK, so I'm going to, in uh, 12 minutes or less, 
create a provider to pull that data into uh, the micro app service and use that to govern access to uh, this micro app. So first of all, what we'll do is over here, we'll just check that there are no subscriptions. OK, so we removed that subscriber. So if we go back here again, refresh a couple of times, we should see that uh, for some reason it always takes at least one. There we go. So I'm no, I have access to zero micro app actions there. OK, let's change that. OK, so I'm going to create a new user provider and I have all of my necessary uh, data so I can cut and paste it if I can actually make my fingers work correctly. So I'm going to call it my Salesforce provider. Now, this base URL, this is where that API lives. So I happen to know that my base URL for this Salesforce environment, I'm using this thing called my domain. So it lives at this super bat dev ed and its services data v52. So this is really where the, the, the prefix for every API call. And I'm going to use OAuth2 to um, authenticate to Salesforce. Now, Salesforce, I can leave these with the default uh, um, settings here for token authorization, token content type, because this is how probably 90% plus of OAuth uh, providers are going to work. Um, they're going to give you a token in uh, the body um, that is URL encoded. Now, the things I need to kind of customize here are the authorization URL. And these are straight from the Salesforce uh, documentation, token URL and refresh token. So these are the URLs that control the interaction back and forth between um, the micro app service and uh, Salesforce. So we don't need to go into detail there. One thing we need to set here is the scope. So this controls what we're going to ask Salesforce for. So we're going to ask Salesforce to access the API um, on behalf of this user. And this refresh token and offline access mean that we can do it after the user's gone away. You know, The user doesn't have to be present for that to take place. And now here I've got the actual client ID and secret that I used before. And uh, here, that's about all I need to do. So what I should be able to do is add that user provider and the next step is to authorize it. Now, I'll confess, I did try this out earlier. So I have been around this loop a few times. If I hadn't, when I click authorize now, you would, and then, sorry, authorize here, you would see a pop-up and Salesforce would ask me all about uh, whether that was OK to share my data. You probably saw there was a bit of redirection and a window appeared and disappeared. What happened was Salesforce recognized that I've already been around this loop with the micro app service and uh, gave it permission. So it's come back as successful. But you would see you know, the, sc the screen you've often seen in different contexts saying, hey, this app wants access to your data. Is that OK? Um, now, at this point, um, I have the potential to call APIs in Salesforce, but I need a script to do so. And of course, I prepared a script earlier. I am absolutely not going to write hundreds of lines of um, code here. Oops, just get rid of that thing. Oh, and now I'm into infinite regress. Here we go. There was a widget covering up these buttons at the bottom here. I'm not going to uh, type in hundreds of lines of code. You'll be pleased to know on screen, um, but I'm going to give you a very brief look at what's going to go on here. Now, what happens is, um, starting at the bottom, I'm defining an integration. And I'm saying, OK, this thing's called Salesforce user groups. And 
it's going to do a full synchronization. I've kept things simple here. I'm not doing any incremental sync. I'm just going to get all the data every time we synchronize. And it's using these built-in models on how users, groups, and the mapping between them work in micro apps. And uh, I will publish this code, and I'll actually write this up as a tutorial step by step, so you'll be able to follow this through. So I'm really not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm just going to point out things like, here is the query that we run in Salesforce to get users. And then we use the Salesforce uh, REST API to we kind of encode that and bundle it into, this is going to be the end of the URL. So the micro apps puts on that prefix that we already configured, puts on the OAuth token, all of that. So we can make a request on that URL. And we'll get some response back. And we will write those. We'll log them to the console and then write them into the data store. Now, the one wrinkle here, I mentioned I was kind of cheating here using that title field because I didn't want to be messing with my username and emails. If that's set on a user, I copy that into the username and email and set that domain. So it's going to appear correctly in, uh, in the data store here. And then similarly, groups have their own query. And there's a, a little bit of, um, we need to get back some mappings here. Because what uh, MicroApps is expecting here is for you to provide the list of groups with each group's parent ID. And in the case of Salesforce, that data is held in this group member table, or object, I should say. So we have to do uh, two queries there. That's absolutely fine. We do as many queries as we like. Uh, and then for getting those mappings, so we, again, we go to that group member table and just filter out them, the group to user mappings because we already did the group to group ones in getting those parent IDs. So this looks intimidating if you haven't spent a lot of time with code, if you don't understand JavaScript. But it's pretty simple what's going on. We're making a handful of queries to Salesforce to get this uh, user and group and group membership data. And what that results in is populating these three tables in uh, the micro app service. And it would be nice if we could see the contents, but we can just see the schema. Now, now that we have that script in place, I've got about four minutes to make this work. So I'm going to go to, uh, sorry, I'm going to get lost for a second. I'm going to go here. And we've got the script there. Now we can synchronize data. So we are, you know, in reality, we would set up a synchronization schedule. But we're just going to do it manually because we want to see uh, what's happening and be in complete control. And it's running. And what we should see is when it finishes, we can look in the logs and see that, uh, yes, we requested some, uh, did some requests, some URLs. We fetched a bunch of users, including myself at that, uh, with that uh, ID there. And then we fetched a bunch of groups, including our wizards group, and we fetched back a mapping. Now, uh, what's going to happen? Well, you will recall that uh, I was not in the wizards group, so that mapping was somebody else. So if I go back here and I refresh a couple of times, sadly, I will still not have access to that uh, micro app action. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to have, uh, uh, you know, because I'm not a wizard, you know, only wizards get to add beers to the beer app. And this will take a second, and it says no actions yet. And I could do that five more times, and it would still say no actions yet. So um, what I'm going to do is go into uh, Salesforce, OK, manage that permission in the actual um, SaaS application. I'm going to go into my wizards group. I'm going to say edit. And I'm going to say, OK, users, I want Pat, definitely a wizard, save that. So at this point, it's saved. Still need to synchronize this. OK, I need to get that data in. But if I'd set up a synchronization schedule, that would happen a minute, five minute, you know, at the end of the day, whatever your choice is. 
And uh, again, I can view logs. And what we should see here is see there were 14 changes. Now there's 15 changes because there is that extra mapping down there. So what should happen is without having reconfigured anything in Active Directory or you know made any direct changes here apart from resynchronizing, that my user over here, if I refresh, it's always annoying that this never happens on the first one. So no actions yet. Try it again. I think there's some caching. Oh, no actions yet. Is it going to work? OK, this totally, totally worked earlier on that I had uh, my action there, but I've messed something up and it doesn't look as if I have any actions. So the demo gods frown at me yet again. But I absolutely, the last time I ran through it, I totally had APJ beers there. And that is the triumphant uh, finish of the demo. Um, I must have uh, hit something. Oh, I know. Did I? Oh, hang on a sec. Did I? I can maybe fix this in the 30 seconds. I forgot to add subscribers there. Oh, OK. So completely expected it would fail because I've got to add my wizards group there. Wizards. Now I'm subscribed. OK, so now wizards is set up. I can refresh. And the second refresh, the third refresh. We're all biting our nails. Oh, OK. This should, oh, OK. So it always happens when something goes wrong is that it snowballs and you forget the important aspects. OK, so we subscribe to that group. We synchronized it. The user's in the group. And now I'm going to keep you here for another hour if that's what it takes. Now it works. Come on, one more time. Oh, now it should work, but it's gone awry. Anyway, with that, I will wrap it up. It'll work in, of course, 10 seconds after we leave this and leave you with these uh, resources. So um, two resources for learning about micro apps. So bit.ly slash micro app journey. And I'll paste these into the chat. Uh, and bit.ly micro app scripting. So this will get you started without any write, without writing any code. This will show you how to write code. You know when you need to integrate with a service that doesn't have a suitable REST API. This will get you into uh, Citrix Converge for all of those great recordings. You can still register at this URL: citrix.ws/converge2021. And if you are interested in that community lab, uh, getting access to um, the pilot of a new offering, citrix.ws slash community lab pilot. So with that, I will apologize for going over and stop sharing my screen and hand things back. Thank you. You muted, John. I remember my first webinar. <laughs> the double there mute, the hardware mute, and the software mute. Thank you, Pat. Nice. That was great info. If anyone wants to learn more about uh, micro apps, uh, automation, or anything that was covered at uh, Converge, the links are in the chat. Uh, also, uh, feel free to join Pat uh, for his roundtable session after the final presentation. Up next, we have an introduction of Goliath. Hello, welcome and thank you to the Citrix user group organizers. I'm John Hinman, marketing lead for Goliath Technologies. And over the next five minutes, I'm going to share a little bit about how we support IT professionals like yourselves proactively monitor and troubleshoot your Citrix and user experience issues. Here's one of the biggest challenges facing the Citrix community today, the shortage of experts like yourselves that are available to support the large and growing number of Citrix farms. Goliath worked directly with Citrix to come up with these numbers, which highlight this challenge. Citrix has roughly 400,000 customers globally. For every deployment, you ideally need two to three full-time experts maintaining those Citrix farms. This translates to a demand of roughly 1.2 million experts. However, 
the reality is there is just slightly over 50,000 fully trained and certified experts. This results in two things. One, you have IT generalists who may not know how to properly monitor and troubleshoot, and as a result are unable to defend Citrix when end user experience issues arise. For example, they don't have enough knowledge to prove to the network team that while the network bandwidth is performing well, it is not enough bandwidth to support Citrix and the users and applications that are utilizing it on a day-to-day -day basis. The second thing is for you, the real Citrix experts. You spend way too much time troubleshooting basic issues, trying to uncover root cause, often trying to prove that the issues are outside the Citrix stack, and then trying to help implement a permanent fix. It's not realistic to think that this resource gap is going away anytime soon. And this is why in conjunction with our customers, Citrix CTPs and the community, Goliath developed our software with embedded intelligence and automation. With this embedded intelligence and automation, Goliath spontaneously discovers your entire Citrix delivery infrastructure and all of its dependencies. We have hundreds of pre-built monitors that automatically look for any event condition or failure point that can negatively impact the end user experience. If any of these conditions or performance thresholds are exceeded based on industry benchmarks and best practices from Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, and even our own Goliath consulting experience, the solution auto triggers the appropriate alerts. It is this functionality that enables Goliath to support you, the IT professional, to anticipate issues and resolve them before users are impacted troubleshoot issues quickly and implement fast fix actions, and finally document and report on root cause and prove over time that remedial actions have been successful. This is how we help IT transform from a reactive position to a proactive one. We heard and acted on the needs of IT management and Citrix professionals. Goliath introduced new troubleshooting features that helped you isolate and identify root cause of latency and slowness due to home Wi-Fi or user behavior in less than three clicks. We offered these new data interpretation lines, which highlight performance metrics that are above Citrus best practice thresholds, helping you more quickly interpret performance data so that you can expedite corrective action. We offer similar metrics that drill into ICA and HDX channels so that you can once again identify if root cause of slowness was due to user behavior, such as use of video, audio, or third-party peripheral devices. And lastly, we introduced an end-user experience scorecard, which highlights how your end-user experience compares to the industry benchmarks in other Citrus best practice thresholds. This easy-to-read and interpret scorecard addresses a need we repeatedly heard from management who often asked, what is performance like for our remote workers and how does it compare to peers in the industry? I'll wrap up by offering a little insight into Goliath's client portfolio. From small to large organizations, whether in the enterprise or healthcare space, our trusted clients will share that because of our embedded intelligence and automation, it's as if they've augmented their staff with two to three full-time Citrix troubleshooting experts that are on the job 24-7, 365 days a year. And in the health IT community, it's why Goliath is considered a standard. This is in large part due to our purpose-built integrations with all the major EHR vendors, such as Epic, Cerner, Meditech, and Allscripts, where we can deliver visibility across the EHR performance, user behavior, and Citrix delivery infrastructure. If you want to learn more about Goliath technologies and how we can help you anticipate, troubleshoot, and document your Citrix end user experience, or for a free trial, email us at techinfo at goliathtechnologies.com. We look forward to seeing you at the Goliath booth. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of CUGC XL. Thank you, Goliath. As mentioned, make sure to visit the Goliath booth if you need more info, chat with the staff, and answer the poll. Our next sponsor is Strutterdesk. Hello, this is Rich Severson. Welcome to the CUGC and Stratodesk presentation. We're going to do a quick overview of what Stratodesk is or who Stratodesk is, and then we're going to go into some of the technology features. What is Stratodesk? Stratodesk is the leading global innovator in end user computing management and OS software for VDI endpoints. So, what does that mean? So, there's No Touch Center, the management platform that's used to manage No Touch OS, a very secure Linux operating system built by Stratodesk specifically for VDI and endpoints. So it's a very secure Linux operating system, NoTouch OS. So NoTouch Center and NoTouch OS combined make NoTouch Desktop. 
that is Stratodesk. So let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to, like I said, I'm going to do a little bit of PowerPoint and then I'll show you some of the features. Obviously, we've got limited to five minutes, so we're going to go as quickly as we can. All right. With 4.5, we introduced the new role-based access controls and the new role-based access controls are going to give you the uh, NoTouch Center administrator, the ability to create different roles, different users, different groups, and give the ability to have specific controls over specific devices, identities, and groups. But the most important thing about this is the fact that it's going to enable us to have true multi-tenancy within No Touch Center for those that are MSPs and service providers, we're going to want to be able to have multi-tenant uh, architecture within No Touch Center, which of course is part of the reason why we've introduced the uh, No Touch Center REST APIs, where you have the ability to do that and create those via scripted access. Also within uh, No Touch Center 4.5, we introduced multi-factor authentication via RFC 6238. The key thing here is this gives the administrators the ability to control access to No Touch Center using uh, one-time passwords, tokens, uh, authenticator applications, whatever your favorite access security is. So it enhances the security of access to No Touch Center. You know, for those that are even, you know, whether they're public or private instances of No Touch Center. Um, having the ability to introduce and bring this into No Touch Center takes No Touch Center one step further as far as security. Also in the 4.5 release, we've introduced the No Touch Center REST API. This is going to be something that people are going to find very useful. We presume probably the MSPs are going to find this very powerful. But basically, it gives us the ability to interact with the No Touch Center using the REST APIs. And in the next slide, you'll see there are several samples of what can be used and the things that are going to be coming within the REST APIs for No Touch Center. Okay. So there you go, right? Uh, obviously, we get the usage of NTCLI. We can set up with different names, get different values, provide different features, functions. Basically, anything that you can do within the UI of No Touch Center, you will be able to do with No Touch Center REST API. Okay. This one I'm really proud of is we now have No Touch Center available natively in the Microsoft Azure Marketplace, right? So think about this. So for those customers that are wanting the ability to be able to deploy a cloud hosted instance of no touch center rather than going through some large exercise of trying to figure out how to import VHDs, etc. You can go to the Microsoft Azure Marketplace, search for Stratodesk, and you'll be able to do that and launch it right there from there. It'll take probably two to three minutes. It's a tremendous offering. Custom icons. This is one of the things that people have been asking for for a while. As you know, in the case where you may have multiple connections. Uh, multiple Citrix connections, those kinds of things. You can now put custom icons on those connections to be able to differentiate line of business applications versus, uh, you know, CRM type applications, those kinds of things, right? So you have the ability to do full custom application icon support, um, including favicon support. So for those that are doing browsers and those kinds of things. Um, that's pretty much everything as far as the PowerPoint. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump into No Touch Center demonstration. Okay, so what I've done is I've jumped over to No Touch Center and I've kind of shortcutted a little bit here and jumped to the roles based access control and I went to the roles and the users. Here you can see I've got an A admin and a B admin and I've got an A tenant and a B tenant, right? So again, having the different role based access controls, you can separate those tenants and those users be able to do that. I'm also going to jump real quick again given the fact that we're limited in time we're going to go to admin as a user I'm going to go to account settings and you see here this is where I can turn on the multi-factor authentication configure uh, the one token one-time passwords okay so that's about all the time we have for today so sorry for making it so quick but with a five limit limitation or limitation that's about as far as we can go so hope that helps uh, again you know the all the new things with no touch center 4.5 now, if you have any questions or anything, certainly let us know. And obviously, all the information is available at the Stratodesk website at stratodesk.com. Thanks, and have a great day. Thanks, Rich. If anyone has any questions for Stratodesk, make sure to visit their booth. Ask them the question. You can ask questions there and make sure to answer their poll. Now to wrap up our final technical presentation. I know people are chomping at the bit for this one. Please welcome CTP's Scott Osborne, James Kinden, Shane Kleinert, and they'll be giving us a deep dive on CVAD service in Azure <laughs> with Microsoft What's, off AVD and Dital Lens. What's going on? Dude, What's where did you on? get that microphone? That microphone is absolutely incredible. <laughs> so I was trying to run over to Radio Shack. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it's because it's I moonlight as a, a, a Twitch streamer. 
going I back to you, the, the futurist uh, session. I thought you were going to do a, like a movie trailer for us. <laughs> and now, introducing. Oh, awesome. In Thank you so much. Yes. Where people are migrating their workloads into the cloud. Yes. Love it, man. Love it. <laughs> there you go, yeah. man. Hey, you, very John. good. Um, right. Assuming we can see the shared present. Beautiful. There we go. Times. All right. So, a um, little bit about the three of us. Um, I am James, uh, solution architect for Incentra over in Australia. Um, play with the Sydney CUGC groups over here, uh, CTP, MVP, and M Mobility. Um, got some Twitter stuff, bit of a blog post up there, and uh, an avid metalhead. So one of my interests is um, sitting on Spotify from about seven o'clock till six o'clock each day. Uh, Mr. Shane. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, James. Yeah. So uh, my name is Shane Kleinert, uh, Senior Solutions Architect for Choice Solutions. Work over there with uh, with Ozzy. Uh, we co-lead the practice there together. And uh, South Florida CGC lead and a Citrix CTP. That's my Twitter. And uh, also, I have uh, notable certifications in uh, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, and Netflix <laughs> based on my binge watching habits. Hey, totally, I mean, all those hours we spend, we should be getting like uh, certs, man. It's crazy. Anyways, check out C on uh, on Apple TV. Really cool. The guy from Aquaman. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Ozzy, I, otherwise known as, uh, I go by my other name of Scott Osborne, but uh, Senior Solutions Architect, Choice Solutions. Uh, I lead the uh, Omaha slash Nebraska, uh, NUG and CUGC groups, uh, CTP, NTC, NGCA, as you can see there. And I'm a, uh, a big fan of bad football teams. So... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how else. <laughs> it's embarrassing even putting it up, but you know, you, you're a fan. You got to do what you got to do. So that, that's shake that's and fun. bake, shake and bake, baby. Nice one. So a bit of um, just light housekeeping. We we've got a link off to a whole lot of different posts and collateral through through this deck. We'll try not to kill you with too much PowerPoint. Um, it's all QR coded. So um, have your readers available if you want to be able to scan those links and have a read. Um, and look, the three of us, I mean, really, we spend a lot of time in um, the Azure, CVAD, AVD world. So for us, you know, the session focus today is very much about um, just having a look at Citrix Cloud, you know, particularly the, the CVAD service with, with Azure-based deployments. Um, we're going to have a bit of a talk around where Citrix and AVD actually combine um, and quite openly, you know, without any of the marketing fluff BS, you can do the math on what that equates to. Um, having a bit of a run through on some just architectural considerations and performance benefits. Uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the the technology that's coming out and the release cadence from Citrix is, is quite focused on performance and cost enhancements. Um, and really, what we're not looking at here is is we're not doing an AVD and see that bake off. Right? That's that's not the focus of this topic. Um, we will touch on where those things combine. Um, it's also not an end-to-end -end for Citrix on Azure. There is a there is four or five hours worth of sessions you can run through just, just scratching the surface on what that looks like. But this is just some basics and, and considerations across you know, 30, 40 odd deployments that we would have done combined over the last 12 to 18 months. It's also uh, it's not a one size fits all reference point, right? Your mileage will vary. Um, you know, we take a lot of learnings, you will have your own learnings. This is just some uh, just some knowledge share in that space. Yeah. Yeah, so I just realized uh, with the CGC XL that we're doing, uh, I got Michigan folks. So my, my, I might be, not be the only Detroit Lion fan on this presentation. <laughs> I just we just realized. After you just said how bad the team was. Oh, uh, but man. Nobody's gonna, <laughs> we're getting rated nobody's like zeros now. Anything. Yeah, nobody's going to say anything. So, uh, yeah, so so quick 101, uh, you know, terminology. Um, just kind of go through. Uh, Citrix Cloud in and of itself really, you know, th there's confusion all the time here. That it doesn't really have any interaction with AVD. Uh, AVD by itself is a platform as a service. Uh, Citrix Cloud, what you're really doing is making uh, use of the entitlements that you get with your, your subscriptions, right? So AVD is comparative to Citrix Cloud service with RD Web, RD Gateway, all that jazz, right? Similar to Gateway as a service, workspace, so on and so forth. Um, AVD is not some other version of Windows 10 or 11. Uh, again, it's platform as a service. 
uh, given us the uh, probably the number one thing is that Win 10, uh, Win 11 multi-session capability, right? So um, each solution, as I mentioned, has its own brokering plane. Uh, you know, a lot of times also uh, when we're up against something, they, they, they will try to compare traditional CVAD with AVD, and that shouldn't be the case. It should be Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service that you're comparing against AVD, right? It's not the traditional CVAD uh, situation. Um, so yeah, so the control plane from a, from a Citrus Cloud perspective, it really fills the gaps, right? The missing components, uh, AVD, native, uh, it's come a long ways, yes, uh, but it still needs from an operational management, uh, you know, management capacity on an enterprise level. Uh, it still needs something to help fill those gaps. So that's really where the Citrus Cloud piece helps out. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, the big entitlement is that Win 10, Win 11 multi-session, but, you know, there, there's other stuff. You get these entitlements for you know, various M365 packages, the E's, the A's are kind of the common one, A3, A5, E3, E5, whether you're education or enterprise or so on and so forth. There's other ones, but um, you get them with your various entitlements for this, right? So that's why it's coming up all the time. And then as a bonus, I just, I get at all the time, Windows 7, no, not really. It's, it's Windows 7, entitlement rights and patches you get with it too. We thought we'd throw that in there at the end. But uh, honestly, uh, it's it, it, just to kind of, you know, sum it up, yeah, that that in and of itself, it ho hopefully it'll give you that kind of the 101. Uh, it's kind of like Citrus Cloud, I, I mentioned, is not a cloud in and of itself, right? Citrus Cloud uses Azure for all those various control plane components that I just mentioned, right? It uses Azure, a little bit of AWS sprinkled in for the gateways of service pops, uh, but for the most part, it's Azure on the back end, right? So, yep. All right, so yeah, thanks for that, Ozzy. So hopefully, uh, it's a kind of nice to kind of have some good idea on, you know, terminologies there and, and you know, where it makes sense. It's important to understand the entitlements of what you have and how Citrix is extending the AVD platform, right? So the first uh, the first one is kind of color coded and you'll see a table here in a second is the CVAD service, CVAD service standard for Azure. That's very specific. That was kind of pre-created. It used to be the Citrix managed desktops uh, product. They had rebranded that and that's only for Azure. And that can also be in user device, CCU subscription yearly or monthly for that. We obviously have the advanced and premium versions that we're all familiar with and the same licensing and subscriptions there. So let's take a look at the table so we can kind of see how these entitlements are extending the AVD platform. So these aren't all the entitlements. If you drill into the entitlements, there's under those entitlements, there's features and there's a lot of great stuff. So we tried to highlight on what we see as kind of big value add here. So in the green, this is all basically, um, uh, you know, stacks on top of each other, right? So everything in greed is standard, obviously is in advanced and premium and so on. So MCS, not going to, I mean, MCS has been there forever, but there's been a ton of enhancements on the Azure side. And uh, James is going to go into that right after this. So I'm not going to steal the thunder there because he's going to, he's going to shake the room with some awesome <laughs> stuff there. So, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what that was. But it's not. So virtual apps and desktops, auto scale technology, uh, really, really great stuff. We'll be touching on that later as well. Um, that's really where you can scale up and down your workloads based on uh, utilization, you know, session utilization, schedules, et cetera. Really about cost optimization there. Monitoring is across the stack. So monitoring, we called it basic. There's not really three versions of monitoring, but I call it basic because if you actually are a CVAD service uh, standard for Azure customer, you probably have seen that your monitor looks very different than what you have for uh, advanced or premium. So hopefully they kind of unify that because uh, I definitely some missing features there. Um, and I hope to see uh, some of that as uh, you know get consolidated. But that's why that's broken out. Premium actually has additional stuff like monitoring, uh, additional alerting, and, and those sorts of capabilities. Identity was a big one, right? Because that uh, with workspace specifically being a CVAD for standard uh, Azure customer, one of the things is you can't use storefront on-prem. You're 100% workspace, 100% gateways of service. So the SAML 2.0 stuff really enabled kind of multi-identity, right? You can do you know, BYOD for identity, right? So your duos, your Azure ADs of the world, Okta, et cetera. So, I mean, multi-cloud support is something that got added in uh, from an advanced uh, perspective. That's where you can basically work. And it's not just Azure only, obviously. Now you have resource locations across, obviously, all the clouds and as well as on-premises. That's kind of a big deal there. Um, uh, fast is across the board. Uh, image portability service is something that's uh, newer. It's in tech preview. It's pretty cool. It takes some of the uh, app layering technologies, 
some of the, the probably the best features of the app layering technology is to make your image portable and streamline that across and replicate that across uh, clouds. Today it's tech preview, so check that out. Fast obviously is what's giving us that single sign-on capabilities. And as we talk about identity later, you'll understand how important that is, how important that is for the single sign-on capabilities. Provisioning services, Oz is going to touch on that. WEM entitlements are there on the advanced uh, as subscription. And WEM is actually a big one. If you think about, I would say WEM and session recording. Session recording, in my opinion, is one of the products that was like, hey, it used to be Smart Auditor, and then everyone forgot about it. It's sitting on your shelf. Go check it out. I mean, they really have done a great job with the intelligent triggers and, and the auto pause and resume and all these things that they added into it that are included in premium. Um, and then really probably a big one here, I would say, is is over uh, from an AVD perspective, is the 30 years of protocol maturity around security capability and policy controls, which we'll touch on all those here in a bit, um, especially around like the EDT, UDP audio and all that great stuff there. Um, and policy controls. And I'd say the last thing is, is you know, there's add-ons with performance analytics and and uh, security analytics that can be added across the stack. And then obviously you have the user personalization layer, layered images and stuff like that. That's not there from a um, you know from an image management perspective there uh, on on ABD. And the last thing is just the gateway service capabilities, service continuity, which Oz will touch on a little bit later, is also added in into the platform. That's kind of across the board. So hopefully that covers a little bit of the entitlements. You can understand. We're going to drive into a couple of these specifically MCS next uh, with James, and uh, let's 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 do it. Awesome. Yeah. So. Been quite passionate about, uh, I suppose, the MCS space in Azure for the last six to twelve has, has just been exploding. Um, Yuha is a fantastic product manager. He's one of the one of the guys who will sit down and listen to all feedback across all cloud platforms. And if there's a chance to improve it, it goes into the product. Um, from an MCS perspective, you know, we've just got a link off there. It's your first QR code, just off to a just an attempt uh, to just capture the changes. That are just going on in the MCS world at the moment, right? I'm, I'm finding that their release cadence is so fast, um, they're actually going back and putting new features two months ago in the release notes. So I'm trying to track that and, and get it out there so you can um, consume it in your projects and what such. Um, and we're also linking off to the CVADS um, what's new release notes, right? It's quite an important thing to be staying on top of. Um, there is so much stuff coming out that just benefits um, cost, performance, architecture. It's huge. Um, and one of the things we wanted to talk through with just a little bit of a differentiator between uh, what Citrix deems persistent and non-persistent versus what AVD does. You know, we're seeing a bit of a trend now with Microsoft. You know, your non-persistence style um, conversations are really around user and application data. Right, so I, I put my user data in FS Logix container. Um, my applications, you know, according to them, it's going to be the app attached style path. Whereas in the Citrix world, we have a full non-persistent everything. Right, so MCS consumes on-demand provisioning, meaning that we only create machines once we turn them on. So we we are we are fully on-demand in that space, um, and when we power them off or deallocate them, those machines are blown away, right? So it's a very different take on persistency. And yes, there are some third party tools that are fantastic at bringing some of that capability into ABD. Um, but one of the big arguments with Citrix and MCS has always been, I want to destroy that machine and everything that was on it before the next person gets in. That's been extended out to Azure. Um, of course, it's crazily customizable. So there are use cases where that doesn't work very well in Azure, and you may want to be keeping system disks around the place. You know, when we when we deallocate and destroy, the only thing that we have left in Azure to represent our BDI workloads is a NIC and an identity disk. That's that's all that's left. So, you know, we have some customization available there. We can keep system disks if we want to. We can keep VMs if we want to. Um, you know, it's all driven through the Windows and the GUI these days, which is kind of impressive. Um, and we've got a whole load of functionality with MCSIO, which is probably a topic in itself, which we won't delve too far into in this session around where you would use MCSIO and where you might not. Um, but the point is, it's crazy customizable. And what we see from a release cadence is usually we get functionality via PowerShell, and within a month, it's in the GUI ready to go. So what we've really struggled with a lot of the time with projects at the moment now is that things get better halfway through a project 
and you might be re-architecting as you go. It's a good problem to have, um, but it's staying on top of it's really important. We have a look at some more of the enhancements and, and why MCS is so good in Azure is it's everything you know about um, Citrix provisioning wizards, be it PVS or MCS now, right? it's very easy to drive. Um, it's a very familiar interface. Uh, it has full PowerShell backing if you want to drive it that way, um, but it's just easy, right? Anyone can pick up MCS and consume it and drive it well. Um, there is a Citrix focus on reducing image complexity. So Shane touched on this before with the image portability service. Um, watch this space. Well, I can't say too much there, but when you start seeing what the plans are from a, an MCS workflow into image portability, it's actually quite impressive when you start thinking about cross-cloud um, deployments and on-prem with Azure and that whole hybrid space. Uh, and there's also a big focus on the shared image gallery um, to simplify multi-region. So if any of you have played in Azure with multi-region, um, we can do it now. It's not the fastest. Um, the SIG has just been brought in over the last sort of six months to lay the foundations for us to start driving that um, and enhancing that capability a bit more. Um, there is a forever changing limits conversation that's happening up in Azure. Um, so watch for your hosting connection limits. Um, we've got a link off there to the current articles on, on what they are. Just watch them, they do change. Microsoft change regularly, Citrix then test and jump onto the top of them. Um, things like hosting connections. If you have an older deployment and you're already consuming Azure, um, there's a good chance that you are uh, capped on the old limits if you haven't manually changed them. Whereas for new customers, these are, you know, the defaults are now uh, optimal. Um, but again, things change really quickly, so important to stay on top of it. Touching on the uh, the shared image gallery side of things, um, so at the moment it's it's you know anyone who's familiar with AVD has most probably consumed the shared image gallery at some point. Um, at the moment, Citrix's focus on this and, and what we've released is fairly limited, and so its job currently is primarily to do two things. One is to improve bootstorm performance when you need to be turning on a whole stack of machines. Right? These things coming out of um, SIG with a number of replicas improves that boot time significantly. Um, the second one, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail, is really around enabling ephemeral disks, which is a really huge change for VDI workloads and has been probably the biggest thing to hit over the last you know, three months. The moment, the SIG is very junior. Um, it is limited to or is configured as a shared image gallery per catalog. So for each catalog that you spin up, you're going to end up with a SIG. And that SIG is not fully featured. It's not fully functional. So Citrix will manage that SIG in the way that it needs to. We'll manage it through the version lifecycle. It will manage scaling it accordingly. Um, but you are effectively to leave it alone and let Citrix do its thing. Right? It's not there currently allowing us to do image replicas across the globe and have multiple catalogs coming from it. That is coming, but it's not there yet. For the most part, you won't really need to change the defaults on the replica ratios unless you are doing something really funky. Um, and we've got a, a blog, just a link off to one of the blogs, just running through the architecture of it, how it fits together, how they've tagged it and what such. So quite interesting to get your head around how Citrix are currently using that SIG and, and where you would or might not use it. From an ephemeral disk perspective, you know, this is something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, ephemeral disks are, from a VDI and a shared hosted standpoint, these are like your saving grace from a performance standpoint. These things, um, basically each VM in Azure uh, has the ability, depending on its SKU, to, to go and put its OS disk onto local SSD cache. So every OS disk that you spin up is, is typically a managed disk that lives on the network somewhere and there's a tax to, to attaching it and getting to it. It's all scalable. But the, the ephemeral disks are free and they are lightning fast. Um, the beauty of that is MCS. So MCS now has full awareness and full capability to consume them. 
Now, when I start thinking about the implications of that, that is, that is faster throughputs, that is better scale, it is better density, uh, it is lower cost. It's a really awesome um, improvement in that space. And something that AVD uh, spoke about quite heavily and things like Nerdio um, do really well in the AVD space. Um, now we've got it available in the Citrix world. And it's easy to toggle on and off, which is really cool. So we're looking at IO and latency reduction. Got a link off to a blog there where um, Lee Jeffries and myself did a whole lot of benchmark testing and the results were just incredible um, with a P10 versus a, a, an ephemeral. So we need to be conscious that it is not compatible with MCSIO. Um, doesn't really make sense to have those two running together. So it's been taken out and you can't spin it up. Uh, we have a direct requirement for the shared image gallery. So no SIG, no ephemeral disk. Right? Um, an ephemeral bit disk does not survive a deallocation of a machine. It, it goes away and is destroyed. So we, we sort of stream out of the SIG into the VM and off we go. Need to be really conscious of OS disk sizing and the VM size capability. You can't have um, a giant OS disk fit into a small cache. So when you're sizing this, we need to be looking at the VMs, understanding what size cache we have available to us um, and whether or not we can we can slot into that, that cache. There is some work, it's in preview at the moment to allow us to use some temp disks rather than cache, but that's currently not out. It will be supported by Citrix as soon as Microsoft take the preview flag off it. Um, so yeah, there's a link there off to the blog. Um, very easy to drive. It's, it's in the GUI. I know it's in the Europe and Asia pack regions. I'm not sure if it's out in the US region yet. Very much worth having a look at it. I think when we talk about performance um, and where we need to be focusing on to get this experience really um, high end, accelerated networking in Azure is a really important one. Um, basically, the ability to take uh, software switching out of the mix and move handoff onto hardware in Azure. Right? So it's the old SR-IOV capability. Um, has really incredible results under the right circumstances. Um, it's not enabled by default with MCS unless you are using the new host profiles, which I've got a screenshot over here. So this is basically taking a machine template and using that to spin up VMs. Um, it can be automated. So I was doing this for quite a while with some Azure automation. There's a, there's a QR code up the top that'll take you off to those scripts and how that fits together. Um, and it's, you know, the documentation from Microsoft is a little bit um, out of whack, right? So they talk to the fact that it's only supported on server OS, for example. Um, it's fully supported on Windows 10, Windows 10 multi-session, that the documents are just delayed. So again, got to watch out for your machine specs. We'll make sure that our, our machines support accelerated networking, but huge wins uh, for client server style applications for file services and what's that. You just need to understand how that fits together. Um, very, very uh, important is the architecture of our VNets when we talk in accelerated networking. If we have multi VNets, um, we lose all of that benefit, right? This is very much a solution to put file servers and BDI workloads in the same VNet, for example, so that we can we can maximize the throughput to each of them. Quick touch point on um, some automation enhancement. So MCS is coming along really quickly. It doesn't do everything. Um, you know, Azure automation is actually a very simple way of filling in some blanks. So a few examples there, we've got, you know, an accelerated networking run book, which I use around multiple customers very successfully. Um, had one for identity disk conversion. Um, we used to have identity disks were quite an expensive piece of the puzzle. Um, so there was some automation to go and change the SKUs on them and bring them back. Um, managed identities, another one that's nice and easy. Um, if you've got applications that are needing managed identities, we can automate that with MCS. Um, extension deployments, you know, maybe automation makes sense. Azure policy might make sense. And really, um, what's next? So what I've got is a framework. It's very easy to extend. So if there's, if there's other things out there that MCS doesn't do from an Azure perspective yet, um, 
should be easy to plug into this sort of thing. Very quickly, um, some tips around the dedicated VDI side of things. Um, so MCS full clone um, or manual builds. Uh, that's where we sit with the, the dedicated VDI side of things. Um, interestingly, identity disks really don't serve any purpose that I can see uh, with dedicated VDI. So there are cost, you know, there's a cost saving there to killing those things off. Um, and we see a lot of a lot of customers switching from MCS and manual catalogs, right? So we might use MCS to go and deploy the workloads. But if we need to start thinking about things like um, proximity placement groups, or if we're talking about DR and ASR and all that sort of things, you typically want to get those machines out of the MCS catalogs and into a manual one. You have a lot more flexibility there. Um, and a nice new feature has just landed around auto updates for um, those dedicated VDIs being driven out of um, the cloud service itself, which is really cool. Proximity placement groups are a lot easier to tackle with persistent VMs. And this is about you know, my insanely latency sensitive grouping of machines, you know, putting my servers and my VDI machines in the same PPG so I keep them as physically close together as we can. Can't do that with non-persistent because the machines don't exist. Um, can do it with full clone provisioned or you know, separated out dedicated VDIs. DR and failover. Um, ASR is very good for this, um, you know, and, and backup and restore via Azure backup. It is extremely smooth. Um, I've got a link up the top off to how this fits together and, and some of the considerations you'll have to do around hosting connections and keeping power management in a scenario where you fail over different regions. Um, worth a look at that. The auto scale side of things and some benefits around uh, dedicated BDI, it still exists. Um, auto scale is very powerful, um, very fast and very reactive. So it definitely still has a huge part to play when we're talking dedicated BDI. Um, one of the things that we don't have available to us yet, which Nerdio does really well in the ABD space, is maybe I should look at um, switching my um, deallocated machines. Maybe I should switch their hard drive SKUs back to something a little bit cheaper when they're not powered on. Again, stuff we can handle with automation, like if there's enough demand. Um, and then the last point is um, it's a lot of talk about profile management with dedicated BDI as well. Um, something worth looking at They're really often not worth the tax of, of having a profile management solution just back them up um, usually if you go in dedicated vdi it's for performance and compatibility um, localizing everything is a beautiful thing mr oz yeah which brings us to what everybody's here for pvs and azure baby so <laughs> Yeah, the QR uh, code at the top is actually for the tech preview. If you do have a love for, for PBS and are looking to, you know, uh, test it out in Azure, that's the uh, Podio form to, to do so. So, uh, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of PBS and have been forever. I'm also a big fan of MCS. Uh, we work in the it depends world. So we, we do a, a fair share of uh, both over the years. Uh, yes, recently all of our cloud stuff's been MCS. Uh, we do a lot with Nutanix on that side, it's all MCS. Uh, but here we are, PVS is uh, alive and well in Azure and it's due to, uh, I think, you know, some big enterprises that really uh, needed it, wanted it. Uh, anybody that's administered and done PVS over the years, um, oh, here keyboard. Uh, anybody that's done PVS over the He's got, he's got a gangster keyboard there, man. It's like, <laughs> like man, quiet keyboard. I know. He's got the old well, IBM keyboard from like back in the day with the big. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. So I was watching some, uh, there's been some deep dives on PBS and Azure. I tell you what, it smokes MCS as far as the provisioning of the machines. Uh, so they did a deep dive for us on the partner side. It, and they showed, you know, 6,000 targets in, in two hours of processing time, which if you do the math is like uh, 1.2 seconds of VM to provision over three resource uh, zones, uh, resource, you know, so the three locations, 6,000 targets, you know, not even two seconds of VM. And then 
rebooting them all staggered. It was like less than four minutes, uh, you know, per VM rebooting the whole environment in, in 55 minutes. It's pretty darn impressive. Um, so this is all tech preview, uh, like I mentioned with the uh, with the Podio form there today, and 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 you uh, the design up top here kind of gives you a, a synopsis of what it looks like. Um, there's a lot of traditional components involved right now with the tech preview, but that is changing, right? So it's tried and true PBS and Azure. Uh, it requires right now the supporting infrastructure like you know it today, right? But that is changing, right? So my last bullet here is when it when it goes up for GA. Uh, there's going to be more of that moved out of the traditional PBS stuff that you know today, right? You're still going to have PBS servers uh, right now, um, but the cloud licensing is in play. The Azure SQL is in play for that service. Uh, support for like VM deletion uh, for stuff that James talked about on the MCS side. So right now the tech preview doesn't have those things. Just know that, uh, but the GA will is, is from what I'm being told. Um, so it's... Uh, it isn't interchangeable with the PBS on-premise VDIS, but uh, the uh, Citrix Image Portability Service that Shane had talked about in his slide uh, can be used uh, for uh, taking your your VDIS uh, on-prem and and using them here because it, it does a really slick job of of, of basically uh, making those available for this service. Right, uh, you got to use the UFI boot. The Gen, Gen 10 Azure VMs have to be used for your master VM, I should say. Um, uh, for that purpose, and it supports Azure files for VDIC storage. So re really, it's come it's coming a long ways with with various Azure native services and support there. So it will be down to just like the traditional PBS servers uh, that you have to worry about. But I tell you what, just it has a couple small disks, has your write cache, uh, you know, as you can see there. Um, and and as far as provisioning and speed of getting stuff up, it, it's quick, right? So. Um, that's pretty much, I just want to note that, that it's not just an MCS world up there in Azure anymore. PVS is coming, baby. It's coming back. Well, real back. PVS folks, please stand up. Please. Go. All right. So, all right. Auto scale, a shaking bake here time-wise. All right. So, uh, so yeah, auto scale, basically it's a, it's a feature that's traditionally a lot of us know is that was power management on the delivery group that got broken out as a separate function for auto scale capabilities, which basically gives you. Um, native capabilities uh, hooks into Azure so, uh, to basically go ahead and, and uh, power on your VMs, power off your VMs, and also scale those VMs, uh, turn them on based on capacity or load, right? So you want to look at, um, you know, if you're in a cost sensitive environment, you're doing pay as you go, maybe you're dealing with like shift work and things like that where they're not always on, right? You can use, you can really tune those auto scale policies to those specific schedules and you'll end up much more cost efficient uh, in your environment. And you can see on the right, it's a little bit small, but now they're starting to bring this into director, uh, sorry, into monitor. How dare I use the old term? Shame. <laughs> so so uh, for, for monitor to actually start tracking this, right? And, and give you an idea to basically tell you, for instance, and say, hey, you know, here's the number of VMs in the trend that are actually on and being used. So based on that, here's what you're potentially saving using the auto scaling technology and also give you an idea of what you need to reserve, for instance, right? So this works hand in hand with session limits and, and there's a QR code at the top, which is important. James kind of does a refresh around session limits because now that multi-session Windows 10 is in the mix from Azure, right? Because we're talking specifically Azure here uh, as well. Um, you know, things like, like the traditional session limits that were inside of Citrix policies are not work, gonna work, right? You need to do those through GPO because it's considered multi-session, right? So you wanna understand that. And also there's the ability to set those session limits within auto scale. Uh, so you have the ability to do that. And you have to think about when you're talking about auto scale is when you, this kind of gets into like a little bit around the instance sizing as well. We couldn't even get into that because of time limitation, but bottom line is, you know, you just start, you have to start thinking about, you know, scaling up or scaling out your environment based on the custom workloads that, that you guys have, right? And it's important to test and you'll see some information from uh, uh, Automates here. They're doing some stuff on, on um, uh, you know, custom, testing custom workloads and things like that. You want to test your actual workloads, give you an idea where it makes sense, where you sit there. There is a PowerShell script specifically for provisioning and deprovisioning. So as James mentioned, it starts as a PowerShell script. It gets built in. that will actually provision your MCS workloads and scale up the environment and also deprovision, which is pretty cool. Um, reserved instances. So you have pay as you different ways to pay, right? So you have pay as you go, then you have reserved instances one or three years. Essentially, um, you know, when you're reserved your instances, you're up to, you know, potentially 72% savings can go up to 80% with licensing. It also manages on the size of the environment, all that stuff. But point being is you want to 
understand your environment, understand, you know, how that environment is kind of scoped out from like a shift work perspective. So you can, you can reserve a portion of those instances. And then you want to look at, so it's going to be a mix, right? You also want to look at your load balancing method as well to kind of close that out. You have globally now, if you notice, right, you have the traditional load index policies that are in Citrix policies, but globally on the CVAD service, you have vertical and horizontal load balancing. Similar to AVD is uh, breadth and depth first, right? In this case, it's breadth first and depth first. In this case, it's vertical, which is scale up and then horizontal is go across each of the servers. If you're a reserved instance scenario, you might want to go switch it back to horizontal because you're already paying, right? But the thing is, that's a global setting. So you want to take that to account in, in your specific environment. So yeah, that's a little bit about auto scale. Definitely take the time to tune those policies. It can really save some cash. Oh, you're on, you're on mute there, Ozzy. And my bad. My, my daughter came home from school screaming uh. and yelling crazy stuff, you know. So, all right. So profile <laughs> management, just real quick, you know, for uh, the CVAT service. I, you know, uh, James has uh, beat, beat this one to death quite a bit on the FS logics versus profile management and so on and so forth. But profile management, man, it fills the needs uh, in, in a lot of ways, right? So, um, you know, it's... It, <laughs> The QR code here, right tool for the right, right fool. Love it. Uh, definitely recommend that one because that, it's not a one size fits all matter it, 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 by any stretch of the imagination, right? So uh, other things is you can, you know, the, uh, the Citrus Profile Manager has the capability now if you haven't looked in the latest stuff to actually replicate to two different locations uh, at log off or at write back. Um, you know, so there's, there's, a, if you haven't seen the new features and policy settings of profile management, really take a look at that. Um, and, and it, it goes a long ways with, with, with the Azure solution as well with, with still using profile management, obviously FS logics, Azure files, Azure NetApp files, whatever your, your choice is there for what makes sense at your scale is, 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 is going to be a thing, but, uh, pro, don't forget about profile manager, right. And the capabilities, right. Um, the backup. V, the one we can never pronounce, the BB, whatever. The back of two tool that Silent, they're changing baby. the name of. <laughs> that, that one there is kind of our go-to third-party tool for, for FS Logics in particular. Block-based, uh, you know, replication, not active-active, but really, or really meant to be active-active. But, uh, you know, it's a cheap third-party tool that gets the job done for, the, for, for replication purposes. Uh, you know, for container, UPM data, uh, all that stuff, right? There's a discount code, as James has here, but uh, really, it's just a fantastic tool that fits the needs, uh, you know, that fits that need well uh, for, for, what it's, for what it can do, right? So, um, yeah. And then, right. uh, yeah, go ahead, Jane. Sorry. Yep. No, I got it. Uh, just time is time is creeping up. Yeah. So, uh, see, Jen's over. She's they're in the corner sweating right now. Like, are they gonna get through? It? <laughs> All right. So, we got ten. We got ten. Uh, seven minutes and fifty-two right. seconds. But who's go counting? Baby. So, <laughs> yeah. So basically, here's how we're gonna cover this, right? So, so CVADs on Azure, right? Uh, you have Azure Files, which is platform as a service. You also, James is gonna talk about clustering and some of the other options. Definitely go with more where you can, and there's reasons why you would choose one or the other. But platform is a service offering, so look at you know Azure Files as well as NetApp Files. Take a look at those four, five QR codes at the bottom. These cover very, five distinct areas around Azure Files that are extremely important. James just did an incredible job, really providing such awesome details across all these. You can do native uh, Active Directory join for the storage accounts. You get native SMB. You know, contributor NTFS permissions and that sort of thing works really well with uh, FS Logics uh, in Cloud Cache. He talks through that in the QR code number three. Um, you, you know, if, if required, you need to optimize and secure those uh, traffic flows. You can look at private links or private endpoints, right? And, and he talks through that as well. Um, the biggest thing here with, that, with Azure Files is it scales literally, right? So if you need more IO, you have to pay for more capacity. That's probably the biggest thing to understand, as well as understanding just like like FS Logics in general is. It, it, it's a silent killer with latency, right? And, and so you want to make sure that you monitor those metrics. So the QR code number five, it goes through a Citrix article. James covers it in his articles too that talk through the specific storage account metrics to monitor. You want to be able to look at those to monitor both capacity because as you know, you lose capacity, it's it's a done deal for FS logics um, and, and whatnot. And same for same for latency. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and jump to the next one. 
uh, so so Azure, you know, uh, sorry, NetApp files on Azure, right? So ANF basically is it potentially can give you the best bang for the bucks for performance if you're a larger environment. It's uh, it's very flexible. It's a minimum of a four tip buy-in, so twelve hundred dollars US, just just Azure cost calculator, right? Uh, you know, pricing applies, whatever, right? So simple to integrate with Azure AD, of course. Uh, scan the QR code for a, a course a detailed article here from Mr. Kinden. Um, not and, and same thing with Azure. Azure Files is much more available. In this case, uh, Azure Nano Files isn't available in all regions. And then he does a, a fantastic job in the storage options blog. So scan that QR code, talking through other things, right? It's not just the technical reasons, right? It's governance, security, replication, data availability, these other reasons as to why you would go which way. So definitely take a look at that for, for FS Logics Container. So that's probably the quickest I ever went through a slide. So let's go ahead. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yep. and in in the essence of, of time, um, file server clusters. There's some info on it. it. Just don't do it. Try, try and avoid <laughs> it. You know. So we'll we'll belt through that slide entirely. Um, yeah, it's probably <laughs> very conscious of time. Yeah, yeah. Just real quick, uh, you know, workloads continuity. You want to be cognizant about your resource layer, where you're putting those. You know, fail over to different regions. Uh, the multi-region capability is there. Zones are supported with MCS. Uh, it's very simple to do. Uh, ASR, James alluded to that earlier. Um, dedicated, protected, you know, can be protected with ASR. Make use of it, please. Um, but then Citrix has its own service continuity. Uh, just, you know, make sure the service continuity, you got to, if gateway as a service goes down, you got to have direct line of sight, uh, storefront, localhost cache. Take note of the storefront advanced health check equals on when you're in more than one resource location. Always put that in your storefront servers. Just know that localhost cache and service continuity are kind of you know different versions of uh, of different things. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that okay. So this is going to be tough. To cut. There's a lot of options for directory <laughs> services. Uh, you know, you the most what's, what's laid out like this, right? You have now you have non-domain uh, join option with an M, with an MCS with, from a catalog perspective, which is pretty awesome. Non-domain join technically. It's great for contractor scenarios or scenarios we don't need obviously domain resources. You can do you know VPN back on home, whatever it is, the scenario is, you can do single sign on with that, right? Because it actually creates it, it mints a local account on the fly, so it gives you that traditional single sign on with Azure AD. All the other options outside of traditional Active Directory services requires fast for single sign on. Know that you obviously we talked before about SAML 2.0 for uh, for BYOD from an identity perspective, and the most and and hi hybrid Azure AD join is supported. Uh, native Azure AD join is roadmapped. And the last thing here is basically um, traditional Active Directory services, the most flexible and robust if you're talking about kind of a multi-cloud architecture, right? Because Azure AD domain services actually can work pretty good, but there's limitations there and it's Azure only. So, yeah. There's a nice slide. We're not going to talk through it. Don't have time. Um, really quick, Azure design highlights and what such, right? This is just about have a look at your subscription model. Um, have a look at the implications of what that subscription might look like when you're doing things like accelerated networking and what such. It's a whole load of guidance from Microsoft on best practices and preferred architectures. Just be con cognizant of the impact of those. Watch the resource grouping. Um, watch for tagging policies. There's lots of changing around resourcing. Networking, avoid inspection at all costs, particularly between your VDAs and cloud connectors. Hello, Palo Alto firewalls. Watch out for those bad boys. Um, again, Watch your hub and spoke architectures. Um, disable accelerated networking on ADCs. It's turned on by default and it's killing ADCs at the moment. Availability, typical preferences, availability zones, availability sets at an absolute minimum. Um, what's coming next? You know, stay tuned across the Citrix roadmap. Um, very nice and informative. We're already seeing, you know, um, Azure VMware solutions supported by me. MCS, we've got a whole lot of stuff going on with Nutanix clusters on Azure. Uh, it's just a crazy changing space and, and stay stay across tech zone. There's a whole lot of really good architectures there as well. And we're done. All right. And we got Obviously two minutes for questions. For the last 10 minutes, we got there. We got there. <laughs> Thank you, Ozzy, Shane, James. Yeah, for sure. You guys are all rock stars. Uh, make sure that if anyone has any questions, right on the right-hand right side, there's yeah. a, a sessions button. Um, hit, hit that sessions button. They're going to be doing a roundtable session in about 15 minutes. Uh, but before then, we're going to hear from Tenzig. Good morning, Kevin. Glad to see you. I'm excited. We're getting another chance here to connect with CUGC members and Citrix users. How are you? 
I'm very good, thanks, Michelle, and good morning to you, or rather as it is here, good afternoon. And yes, I too happy to have the opportunity again and, and hope everybody watching is safe and well. Agreed. And for those who watching who don't know Kevin Greenway, he is our CTO and I'm the United States Marketing Manager here at Tenzig. Uh, since the pandemic, the Tenzig CUGC partnership has grown even more. We've been connecting with people in different ways, whether it's been email, webcasts, social media, or opportunities like today. So that's a good thing. Kevin, can you talk to us a little bit about how this has been so in terms of Tenzig product offerings for Citrix and various innovations? Yes, absolutely. And CUGC is a great community with input from industry experts, as well as importantly, Citrix users, new and old. And as we've attended various CUGC events, we've listened to the community to understand what is in hot demand. This has been ever important, both during the initial onset of the pandemic and now thereafter. And the big hot topics in demand for our endpoints are unified communications and hybrid working. Yeah, it sounds like unified communications for hybrid working has been a main customer challenge and continues to be so. Um, and security, is that another big issue? Yeah, absolutely. How, how could I not mention security? Um, in the early part of the pandemic, businesses were essentially scrambling to do whatever they could to provide their employees with access to company applications and data. And as employees and services are now outside of the traditional corporate network and office, businesses are taking security more seriously than, than ever before. And as the pandemic is gradually easing off, business leaders are now uh, looking towards Tenzig for our offering of a secure thin footprint based endpoint in the form of a thin client. And it's a simple bridge point to Citrix with a minimal attack surface whilst being rich in the feature set on offer from Citrix. Yeah, a lot of these challenges that you're mentioning have been addressed in past CUG web webinars with Citrix, other how-to videos and support on Tenzig.com uh, as recently as a few weeks ago. Uh, are there a few that are top of mind that might help people that are watching today? Yeah, the, the ones which stand out are firstly the very first Teams optimization deep dive video we did actually with Rob Beekmans of Citrix and that was back in May 2020. And this included a complete troubleshooting session. And then the second video, which was performed in summer this year with CUGC, which included an update on the latest for Teams optimization, as well as support for Zoom VDI and Cisco WebEx. And then third and final, the latest for our recent October CUGC, which included again, most recent updates on Teams optimization, browser content redirection and Citrix Cloud. Yeah, I remember those all too well. Um, uh, just we have to wrap things up here, Kevin. Uh, we know that there are other endpoint providers out there, but we also know that Tenzig is different. And from your point of view, how so? Yeah, I mean, we're solely focused as an endpoint provider for Citrix. We're experts in remoting technology of graphics, audio peripherals, and other more recent remoting optimization features. We offer the complete solution under one roof, including endpoint hardware, um, and also Linux or Windows based OS and ent enterprise free centralized management. And our customers choose Tenzig because of our approach to make the endpoint simple, but effective to use both for its users and employees and IT management teams. Yeah, I agree. Hey, listen, Kevin, it's been great talking with you. And uh, for anybody that's looking for more Citrix Tenzig innovations or updates, please go to our website at tenzig.com. We've got a fantastic video gallery there for you, a VDI blog. You can also stop by and find us on the Tenzig YouTube channel, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. And everybody have Thanks, a great Michelle. day. Thank you. Have a great day. You Bye. too. Bye. Thank you, Michelle and Kevin. And for our final sponsor of the day, Shane will tell us about Automai. It's exciting to be here and I appreciate you asking me to come up here and kind of share some of the experiences uh, that we're seeing across our EUC customers and how we're solving those challenges using the, uh, the Automai Loader product. So yeah, thanks again and uh, let's, let's jump into it. Okay, let's get into our first EUC challenge. It's really around the CAN workflows that have kind of been the EUC de facto standard over the years around task, knowledge, and power worker 
those really don't fit the mold for the actual end users, right? You know, replicating the day in the life of the user based on their actual workflows. What are their business processes that they're doing? You know, if you think about it, like canned workflows really fall in line with like a perfect piece of a puzzle. It's very prescriptive. Where custom applications are not prescriptive. You don't know how they're going to perform. So it's not going to fit together like a perfect piece of a puzzle. You really have to have a great solution like Automate, which helps us out particularly because they have custom user stories, which is similar to what you would see out there with some of the other vendors. But then using their scripting engine, they allow you to easily record and create custom workflows. And that's really what we're excited about and what helps us with our customers is it decreases the amount of time it takes to create those workflows. So let's talk about challenge number two. So challenge number two is really focused around public cloud instance sizing and cost optimization. There's a fine balance between that. When you look at the three public cloud providers, Azure, AWS, and GCP, instance sizing is very similar and cost optimization is very similar across each of these public clouds. What we're going to be focusing on today is Azure. And when you think about an instance size, an instance size has costs associated with it for every single hour that you're running, right? Every single minute that gets accumulated. So you have CPU, memory, disk, and each of those are kind of broken down into create what's called an instance. And you have different ways to pay, whether it's pay as you go, reserved instance pricing one or three years. How do you determine what's right for you, right? Then you have Citrix auto scale policies to add into the mix. Do you scale up or scale down your environment based on certain shift work? Do you do vertical or horizontal load balance? Think about just Azure in general. There's over 330 instances. That's insane. How do we figure out which one works for us? Well, that's where we get into the solution, and that's what we're going to be really driving into today in this demo is the CVADs on Azure persona. That's where you're taking actual context properties from Azure, from the CVAD service, and bringing it into the load test. And that's how we solve that secondary challenge. And the third challenge is around application and OS updates. Each of your machine catalogs are going to require application and OS updates over time. Automate Loader allows you to do continuous testing, use your existing test plans. So every time you do a catalog update, you can validate if your catalog instance size needs to change or not, or if there's any kind of performance impact. And with that, let's get into the demo and show the CVADs on Azure Persona. Okay, what we're looking at now is the Personas feature inside of Automate Director. Let's go ahead and take a look at an already existing Persona. This is a CVADs on Azure Persona, and it consists of an Azure Service Principle. It gives us the context properties from Azure and the Citrix API keys that gives us the context properties from the CVAD service. And you can see here we're pulling in both clinical desktop and sales desktop delivery. Okay, so what we're looking at here is an already existing test plan. It's set up for 25 users for functional testing, but this can be to scale to thousands of users using the scale out bot management architecture. So with that said, let's focus on the automate persona. So if you can see here, we have the CVADs persona, and with that, it's pulling in both the clinical and sales desktop delivery groups. Those are set to multi-session for Windows 10, so we can automatically see here we have max session counts that are set up. These max session counts should match what you have within Citrix policies per delivery group. And the thresholds are really designed to help you guide you through the journey of choosing the correct Azure instance size. You want to choose thresholds that meet your desired comfort level. Uh, same thing for connection failures for the Citrix service. Final step here in the test plan is to actually add the individual processes or the user workflows. We're just going to go ahead and add one more here for YouTube. Go ahead and set it so 25 users run for YouTube. We'll go ahead and submit that. And then once we're done, we'll go ahead and publish our test. So what we're looking at here is the CVADs on Azure backend metrics report. You can see here we have contextual properties coming from two delivery groups, which we have in the test plan, sales as well as clinical. We have connection failure rates as well as session host properties and delivery group properties that are also pulled in and resource metrics across all session hosts within the delivery group. And what's really nice here is that we also see backend metric stats as well. We can see that memory is about 90% and CPU is about 30%. We might need to take a look at a memory optimized instance. Let's go ahead and rerun the test again. Okay, what you're looking at now is a report that I'm particularly excited about because these are things that we'd have to do manually when we're doing instance sizing. Now we can look at it all in a single place. So we're looking at the two backend metrics reports for two different test runs. You look here at the first one, we obviously looked and went through that report. It was a baseline run. Let's compare that against a new run that we ran where if you look at the test notes, we updated the memory to an E-series because it's more memory optimized. We updated the max session count because we realized it really should have been eight, not five. That's why we're getting those connection failures. And the load balancing method should be vertical, which is really for cost optimization. We did that, failure rate came down to 7%, and it's a much more balanced configuration with memory and CPU just around 50 to 60%. Thanks for watching. Really excited about the CVADs on Azure Persona feature and how it's going to help streamline Azure instance sizing for our customers, and I hope it does for you as well. 
Thanks, Anime. That looks awesome. Now we head to the roundtable discussions. As mentioned on the right hand or left hand column, you guys can see uh, there's going to be a sessions tab. Go ahead and click there. Hop into the roundtable choice. We want to be back here at in 18 minutes at 3:20 Pacific for the prize drawings. Thanks a lot. See you guys soon. After.